Okay, we are going to start the meeting now. Um, the recording is in progress. Um, we will have a call to order. I just want to double check, make sure all of your videos are turned on and your audio is disconnected. Um, to speak, you need to turn your microphone on, which will turn it up and light it red, and then speak very close to the microphone so that the people on Zoom can hear you. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to the board chair, Jacinta McCann. Okay, thank you, Andrea, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to this hybrid BCDC design review board meeting. We appreciate your patience as we navigate this new meeting format. My name is Jacinta McCann, and I'm the chair of the BCDC's design review board. I am located at Metro Center in San Francisco, and our meeting will include participants who are here and those who are participating online. Our first order of business is to call the roll. Board members, please unmute yourselves so, that, so uh, you can respond and then mute yourselves after responding. Andrea, can you call the roll, please? Yep, I'll start with you, Chair McCann. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Strang. Present. Uh, board member Tom Leader. Present. Board member Andrew Wolfram. Present. Board member Kristen Hall. Present. Okay, thank you, we have five present. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we have a quorum, so we're duly constituted to conduct business. I'm going to go through some instructions now. Uh, I want to share some instructions on how we can best participate in this meeting so that it runs as smoothly as possible. For everyone online and in the meeting room, please make sure that you have your microphones or phones muted to avoid background noise. For board members, if you have a webcam, please make sure that it is on so everyone can see you. For members of the public, if you would like to speak during the public comment period that's part of the agenda item, you will need to do so in one of two ways. First, if you are attending on Zoom, uh, on the Zoom platform, please raise your virtual hand in Zoom. If you are new to Zoom and you joined our meeting using the Zoom application, click the hand at the bottom of your screen. The hand should turn blue when it's raised. The second way, if you're joining our meeting via phone, you must press star nine on your, key back, on your keypad to raise or lower your hand to make a comment, and star six to mute or unmute your phone. We will call on individuals who have raised their hands in the order that they are raised during the public comment period for each project. After you are called on, you will be unmuted so that you can share your comments. Please state your name and affiliation at the beginning of your remarks. Remember, you have a limit of three minutes to speak on an item, and we will tell you when you have one minute remaining. Please keep your comments respectful and focused. We are here to listen to everyone who wishes to address us, but everyone has the responsibility to act in a civil manner. We will not tolerate hate speech, threats made directly or indirectly, and or abusive language. We will mute anyone who fails to follow these guidelines or who exceeds the established time limits without permission. For public comments, please note that we will only hear your voices and your video will not be enabled. For members of the public attending our meeting in person in our headquarters building, I will ask you to maintain social distance during the meeting. The board secretary will call you up to the podium uh, to, for public comment. Wearing masks is optional, but recommended in this building. You will be asked to come up to the podium one at a time and to state your name and affiliation prior to providing your comments during the meeting. If you would like to add your contact information to the interested parties list to be notified of future meetings concerning these projects, please call or email the board secretary, Andrea Gaffney, whose contact information is on the screen or is found on the BCDC's website. Finally, every now and, and, and then you will hear me uh, refer to the meeting host, Ashley, who is our BCDC uh, host for the evening. The staff here are acting as hosts for the meeting behind the scenes to ensure that the technology moves the meeting forward smoothly and consistently. Please be patient with us if it's needed. And now the board secretary will provide an update. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, thank you, Chair McCann. Um, this is gonna be a brief update. Um, let me go to the next page. So uh, first is I'm thrilled to announce that the Office of Legislative Affairs has finally approved the DRB regulation changes. Um, this means that the board positions will now have terms. There will be five-year five term limits, um, and I 
I'll go over this in more detail uh, at the next meeting. Um, but the other big change is that we can now appoint uh, alternates directly as opposed to them being current board members. Um, so those are some exciting new changes that um, we will go over in the August meeting because we will not be having a July meeting. Um, so that started in uh, the fall of 2018, those regulation changes and the discussions. So I'm, I'm very happy that they are finally here. The other two items that we have to talk, like give you updates on, uh, the Point Malate development project has been put on hold. Um, so we don't know when that will be coming back to the design review board. Um, but the Point Malate Bay Trail is moving forward. Uh, there's a portion of it that's um, in application for a permit right now. And East Bay Regional Park District and the city are uh, moving that forward. Uh, so there will be I think it's a mile and a half of implementation. Um, and then we are in active discussions about uh, other sections in that area as well. So that's an update on Point Malate. The other um, thing that I wanted to update you on is on June 30th, the commission will hold a special meeting to vote on whether or not to remove the port priority use designation at Howard Terminal. Removal of the port use is a requirement for the permit action concerning the mixed use ballpark development. And staff presented the issues at a special meeting on June 2nd, um, which we'll share the link to uh, because the, um, the audio and the presentation that he gave uh, explains the issue very clearly. Um, so if you want to attend online or in person, the June 30th special meeting, I recommend that you listen to the staff presentation that was given at the June 2nd meeting. Um, it was an eight hour meeting. Uh, the audio is in two parts. You want to listen to the first part of the audio starting around minute 36. Um, the staff presentation is about 40 minutes long. Uh, there are, um, there's a PDF of his slides that you can follow along with his presentation. Um, I think Ashley is putting the link to the audio in the chat for people's reference uh, if they want to see it. So uh, that concludes the staff update and I'll answer any questions from the board. Um, if there are none, then we can move to the review of the meeting minutes. We have two sets of meeting minutes to review this time. Uh, there are summary minutes, there are new format, so I welcome any feedback on uh, that format as well. Thank you, Andrea. And just a comment on the um, uh, the update on uh, the port priority use designation. If uh, if we could get the link sent through with an email to the board, that would be great, just so that we can access that easily. Happy to send that. Great. Okay. So, uh, any other questions from the board on Andrea's report? Okay. We'll move on. Thank you, Andrea, and um, congratulations, especially on getting the fast-tracked uh, <laughs> um, changes to the board, uh, board uh, aspects. And I mean, they really are important changes. So thank you. Well done. Okay, we will move to review of the meeting minutes. And Andrea, I just want you to uh, weigh in here. Uh, in terms of the summary minutes, um, are there, is there any document that you want to share with us at this stage, or um, are you assuming that we've looked at the summary minutes? I hope you have looked at the summary minutes. They were provided with links um, on the website mailing yes. agenda. I can put them up on the screen if that would be useful. Would that be useful for the board, or have you had a chance to look at the minutes? Uh, I've reviewed them. Good. Okay. Yeah. Look, I think we've got a mixed um, level of familiarity with the summary. And for those who are in the room or online, uh, this is a, a new method that we're following, and we're very grateful to the BCDC team for preparing summary minutes. Um, uh, but, Andrea, I'm not sure that everyone's been able to see that link those links. Okay. It's um, in the agenda website yes. page. Um, 
they were linked under the agenda, agenda item for the meeting minutes, um, but I'm happy to share the screen now. Um, or we can... You know, we could approve them at the next meeting, if you yes, like. Yes, that's what I was going to suggest. Yeah. Why don't we defer that, and I think everyone will then be on board with the new format, and we'll have reviewed the three lots of uh, meeting minutes. By okay. Then. Yeah. In the next meeting will have likely have four meetings worth of minutes, because the, the two that were we had agendized for tonight were from the March yes. 7th meeting and then the March 21st makeup meeting, yep. and then we're still working on the April meeting and the May meeting minutes. But I'd like to do it in August, because I think it's quite important that you get some feedback as well from the board on the, you know, the new format and the level of detail, so I, th I think it would be good to spend a, a bit more time on this item. So okay, understood. Yep. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we will move to the next agenda item, which is the first review of Estuary Park redevelopment in Oakland, Alameda County, and uh, this is agenda item four. And to remind you of the project review order, we'll start with the staff introduction. Followed, followed by, by the project, project component owners. presentation, the board clarifying questions, public comment, board discussion and summary, and then the project proponent response, which is a brief response and it's optional as well, but a, a brief response. And uh, with that, I'll hand to BCDC staff Shruti uh, Sinha, and Shruti will introduce the project. Thank you, Shruti. So, so Shruti needs to turn their audio. Uh, I think that's your computer. Yeah. We're getting things ready. Um, I think Shruti's, her screen is being shared and I think she's ready to go. All right, thank you, Chair McCann and good evening, Design Review Board members. My name is Shruti Sinha and I am a Shoreline Development Analyst at BCDC. Before I pre present the staff introduction, I would like to remind the project team and staff to please turn on your video when you're speaking or answering questions. When you're not actively engaged with the board, please turn off your video and mute your microphone so that we minimize distractions on screen. And now I'd like to introduce the, the first project for tonight's review, which is the redevelopment of Estuary Park in Oakland. This project is proposed by the City of Oakland. It is currently under master plan review and in the middle of schematic design stage at the local level and in pre-application stage with BCDC. Tonight will be the board's first design review of the project. Before we discuss the project, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the majority of the land in this area was once water and historic tidal flats, a shared resource between the unceded ancestral homelands of the Huchuin and Jalquin Olone. We offer gratitude to the indigenous people who are the original stewards of the bountiful natural resources of the Bay Area. As you can see from this vicinity map, the project site is located on the western side of the mouth of the Lake Merritt Channel. It is bounded by Embarcadero West to the north, the Portobello Apartments property to the west, and, Lake Merritt, and the, Lake Merritt, uh, the Lake Merritt Channel to the east and the Oakland Estuary to the south. There are several BCDC permits associated with Estuary Park, notably the Brooklyn Basin Permit issued on February 4th, 2011 to the City of Oakland, the Port of Oakland, and Oakland Harbor Partners for the redevelopment of Brooklyn Basin provides a set of conditions regarding the 
Estuary Park subarea. The conditions require an approximately five acre area with landscaping and shoreline park improvements consistent with a future plan development by the City of Oakland and approved by BCDC. Bay Trail improvements must include approximately 16 beaches, at least one interpretive or historical marker, one vertical trail marker, three Bay Trail directional maps, and a 30 to 40 foot wide trail with separated bike and pedestrian pathways and landscaping. On the left is a view of the eastern edge of the park from the Embarcadero. On the right, you can see the Jack London Aquatic Center right at the entrance of the park. This is a view of the western edge of the park from the Embarcadero. The empty field in the middle is a four acre lot that will soon be acquired by the city of Oakland and incorporated into the park. On the far left, you can see the Jack London Aquatic Center, and on the far right, you can see the Portobello Apartment Complex. According to BCDC's Community Vulnerability Mapping Tool, the project site is located within a 2020 census block associated with high contamination vulnerability and low social vulnerability. The social vulnerability indicators in the 70th percentile are renters, people with no vehicle, and people who are not U.S. citizens. It is important to note that areas immediately east and northeast of the project site have moderate, high, and highest social, social vulnerability. In areas with moderate social vulnerability, indicators include renters, people with no vehicle, people who are not U.S. citizens, and people with very low income. In areas with high social vulnerability, Indicators include renters, people with no vehicle, people who are not U.S. citizens, people with very low income, people of color, people with no high school degree, and people with limited English proficiency. In areas with the highest social vulnerability, indicators include all of the aforementioned as well as disabled people and people over 65 and living alone. Regarding potential sea level rise and using current site elevations, this map shows what 24 inches of sea level rise would look like if the site remained unchanged. This project, this project used the, the low risk aversion scenario from the 2018 OPC sea level rise guidance for their park design. Both the low and the medium, high, medium to high risk aversion scenarios are listed in the table on the left with their sea level rise projection. The bottom row shows what equivalent future total water level this map corresponds to for each risk scenario. 24 inches of sea level rise for the low risk aversion scenario is equivalent to a king tide in 2050, which shows some flooding along the shoreline and the western edge of the site. For the medium to high risk aversion scenario, 24 inches of sea level rise is equivalent to the mean higher high water level, which would also cause some flooding on the site. This map shows what 66 inches of sea level rise would look like at the site if unchanged. 66 inches of sea level rise for the low risk aversion scenario is equivalent to a five year storm plus sea level rise at the end of the century, which, show, which shows some flooding and overtopping, which shows flooding and overtopping over the entire expanse of the project site. For the medium to high risk aversion scenario, 66 inches of sea level rise is equivalent to the 100 year storm at mid-century and mean higher high water in the year 2090. The San Francisco Estuary Institute Adaptation Atlas notes suitability for tidal marsh in the interior of the park. The small bits of orange and yellow color along the east and southeast of the park indicate migration space for adaptation. That summarizes my staff introduction to the Estuary Park Project. As you conduct your review tonight and provide your feedback, please keep in mind the public access design guidelines, which emphasize usable and welcoming public space, visual access, connectivity along the bay shoreline, and compatibility with wildlife uses. In addition, the staff report shared with you on June 2nd provided two other questions that staff would like the board's advice on, which are summarized on the screen. With that, I am happy to answer answer any questions the board might have on the site context. Thank you, Shruti. Uh, are there any questions?
clarifying questions from the board? No. No? Okay, we'll move on. Thank you. And now I will hand it off to John Gibbs of WRT to present the project on behalf of the City of Oakland. So we were, you, if you want to stop sharing your screen, Shruti, it sounds like Jake Tobias from WRT is going to share online and present online. Yeah. John Gibbs from WRT is in the room with us tonight. Um, are you on the Zoom meeting? Okay. Um, so if you are going to answer questions, please respond through the microphone and identify yourself when you talk. Thank you. Um, so, Jake, all yours, take it away. Thank you. Um, just first, can you hear me? Okay. Is this a good sound volume? Okay, thanks. John, um, do you want to do some introductory remarks or should we? Should I just take over from here? Not sure if that's technically possible for you to do some introductory remarks. True hybrid uh, format, and this is John Gibbs from WRT, uh, part of the Estuary Park team. True hybrid format, uh, Jake is uh, is elsewhere and remote, and I'm here joining you, and I'll be joining in for any additional questions and kind of follow-up discussion. Um, we're going to give a pretty thorough presentation. We're definitely right in the thick of, of design, of exploring this site with a uh, strong foundation, uh, strong technical foundation of some pretty significant issues that range from contamination that, um, to, to sea level rise to user experience. Um, I believe that um, Christine Reed from the City of Oakland may be also following along here tonight, but this is the project for the City of Oakland and we're the consultant team representing uh, the city for this project here tonight. And with that, I will hand it over to Jake to walk through the presentation. Thanks so much for your uh, good advice and attention this evening. Okay, are you seeing the title slide? Yes? Yes, we can see the title okay. slide, thank you. Thank you, just making sure. Uh, well, uh, so I'm Jacob Tobias with WRT, that was John Gibbs also with WRT. Uh, we're very pleased to be presenting this project, it's just a it's a it's an exciting project on on the estuary on the bay um, and i'll just dive right into it as shruti uh, explained the location of the site is is on the oakland estuary between alameda well next to alameda in oakland um, you can see how it's connected to lake Merritt and a whole network of open spaces that um, link to lake Merritt, but also obviously up and down the bay uh, from to Jack London Square and the new Brooklyn Basin development and, and so on. This is a very exciting part of the city of Oakland that I'm sure all of you are aware of. Just rapid change in land uses and demographics. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about how we want to support the diversity of users that could use this site. Just very briefly, we also understand how important it is as a part of the Bay Trail. Um, this map indicates that the major that the Bay Trail through our site is currently unpaved. Um, it is actually paved in part of it, but um, but you'll see in a in a, a slide a couple of slides further from here, the Bay Trail certainly needs a lot of improvement through most of this site. The site history again, Shruti mentioned that um, you know this was was marshland um, occupied by different groups of the Ohlone people. Um, I think we're familiar with that. I think what's uh, notable here is that the Sunset Lumber Company was the was the company that filled this site, and so the existence of it as a as a land mass 
is due to that lumber company's operation, which was largely responsible for providing lumber for rebuilding San Francisco after the earthquake. So I thought that was quite interesting uh, importance of this site to the Bay's history. Then Lawrence Halperin did a master plan, which was partially um, complete, partially built, um, but we all have that uh, connection to a great landscape architect. And then today the park is quite run down um, and that's why we're here. But nonetheless, it's even still very popular and um, people come down to this site to do all kinds of things. They fish from the existing pier, they come down to practice music, they run their dogs, and, and it's, it's even still a fairly active site, even given its uh, dilapidation. The existing conditions, I think the main point to make here is that our site, um, the limit of proposed improvements, maintains the existing Jack London Aquatic Center and all of its water access facilities. So the docks and the boat ramp, the parking associated with that for the most part are all maintained as part of this project. Um, the existing fishing pier on the southeast side of the corner of the site is also remaining as would the, uh, the historic Halperin Pergola. Uh, I want to note historic not, not in an official sense but I just mean that it's that it's the one that that was built as part of the Halperin project. And then really significantly, also as Shruti mentioned, the park will be expanded from seven acres to 11 acres with the addition of this um, parcel, parcel to be added to the park. We call it the cash and carry site. It used to be a large warehouse called cash and carry, which was demolished. And the, the, that parcel belongs currently to the developer of the Brooklyn Basin project. And as part of the development agreement, is being um, turned over to the city and added to this park. Existing site conditions. Um, the south shoreline is a non-engineered, um, I don't even know if it's fair to call it riprap. It's just armored with rubble and is in very poor condition. Um, the middle picture on the top, you can see that is that is the Bay Trail for all intents and purposes. Uh, so that's what I meant when I said it could be greatly improved. Um, the East Shoreline is, is really where the original Halperin master plan was uh, implemented. There's a strong north-south axis there uh, with a stepped bulkhead element that you can see in that picture and in the lower left. Um, adjacent on the lower right, there is uh, an apartment building called the Portobello Apartments, and that's a significant um, off-site um, factor in our design. And you'll see how that plays in. Uh, the project was conceived quite some time ago and design started in 2018. And since then, there have been four community meetings, uh, as well as stakeholder input um, City of Oakland input, agency input, and out of that community engagement process, the, the program really was driven by that process. And um, this just lists a, a, the, the main program elements, uh, ecological health and wellness, social um, various support and mobility, including the importance of bicycle access, um, sports, including for humans and also play for dogs and human children of all types, different types of skateboarding and roller skating were, were addressed, safety and sight lines being very important. And then of course, the waterfront activities. The community process included a survey and it was very notable to us that of all of this program, the Bay Trail and the shoreline turned out to be head and shoulders, the most important thing to the community. Uh, that really excited us because it drove our design towards the waterfront, which is of course your purview. So we were excited really to see that the community um, kind of embraces that shoreline activity. We'll zoom in on some of these elements, so I won't spend too much time on the overall conceptual site plan. Uh, except I do want to point out just where the BCDC jurisdiction line is. It's, it's this 
uh, this line that my cursor is following. So we do wanna focus on your jurisdictional area, but just to point out um, that there's a lot else going on on this, on this site. And we really wanted to just encourage as much use as possible. So it's an extremely diverse community that can come to this site. Um, and it's a changing community. We wanna support new inhabitants of all the development that's going on around the site. And we also wanna to continue to support the, um, the, the Oaklanders who, who, who are coming to the site now and, and should continue to come to the site in the future. I'll use this slide to just talk about the overall programming. Um, there is an arrival um, program, including two gateways into the park, two primary gateways into the park, a new parking lot, um, a large open space that's a multi-purpose field flanked on the west with a, a natural zone um, that uh, serves as a buffer to the Portobello apartments, and then a really active zone to the east, including a dog park, nature play, um, event plaza that could incorporate skateboarding and skateboarders, a, um, the existing pergola with picnicking, and then the bay trail that wraps the site um, on the east and south a beach, a newly created beach, and I'll talk about that in more detail, gravel beach, and then of course the existing JLAC and all of its uh, program. From a circulation point of view, I think the main point to make here is we are really focusing on access, which is of course your purview here, but there are many, many ways to get to the shoreline, many ways to access the Bay Trail itself, um, starting with, again, the, the, the public access from the Embarcadero, both as a bicyclist or as a driver um, or as a pedestrian. And then I think this diagram sort of speaks for itself that just there is this um, general tendency to want to get to the shore. We feel that when we're at the site now and we want to kind of maintain that emphasis. Vehicular circulation, um, there is a uh, uh, EVA access loop that goes around the site. Uh, but one thing that we will be doing is restricting that from public vehicular access. Currently cars do get onto the site and the community has deemed that uh, to be problematic. People go out there now at all hours of the night with their cars and party all night long. Uh, the neighbors aren't particularly fond of that activity. And it's actually not currently sanctioned. It's just that I think the gate remains open for whatever reasons. Uh, so I do want to mention that public vehicular access is going to be constrained to the, the parking lots to the north. Another driver for the design, of course, is, is sea level rise adaptation. As Shruti described, really this, this whole part of Oakland uh, is susceptible to sea level rise. What we're doing on our site is designing as much of it as we can and really focusing on protecting the investment of uh, the new construction through the year 2070 for 50 years, and then allowing for adaptation to occur on the rest of the site over time as the whole region, the whole area needs to adapt. The JLAC building, we imagine, will need to be reconstructed at some point. And at that point, uh, you know, and then the Portobello apartments also will be starting to see flooding and so and the Embarcadero. So we see an adaptation of our site uh, being dovetailed with broader adaptations that will need to be implemented. But in the meantime, our investment in a public restroom and in the Bay Trail to the extent feasible and um, all of the active facilities that are um, possible would be elevated and protected through approximately 2070. The other thing I want to mention is that the new resilient shoreline design does allow for more of a um, retreat strategy so that this is designed to change over time and allow the sea level to rise and, and change the nature of this beach and um, 
what we call the transition zone. So bird's eye view, just to give a feel for the, the site. And then the more detailed um, plans, I'll, I'll move through these fairly quickly and be happy to return to any of them. Um, this northern one is, for the most part, outside of the uh, BCDC jurisdiction. But again, we want to point out that we'll be providing it's about 75 parking spaces currently in this parking lot, in addition to the existing parking spaces that would be remain, that would remain about north of the JLAC, Jack London Aquatic Center, uh, new boating storage and new public restroom. And then of course the dog park and, and other program elements I mentioned. Moving southward a little bit, just focusing on the shoreline adjacent to a, a nature play zone and within the BCDC jurisdiction, you can see that this existing Halperin structure is, is to remain under which there would be picnic uh, tables. And then to the east of that, the Bay Trail and the Bay Trail would be elevated again to uh, 2070 projected um, 100 year flood event. And then beyond that, some passive seating areas and a secondary trail closer to the shore along the existing bulkhead, which would remain. You can also see here an event plaza that is within the BCDC jurisdiction. Um, this has been designed to allow roller skaters to use it. There was a strong voice for that among stakeholders. And then during events, food trucks could come and occupy this space and support an events that could be of any size, really. They could take over the whole park or just be a smaller event in this zone. And then finally, the southern end, uh, one of the most exciting parts of the project is a redesigned shoreline. And I'll talk about it more in a, a couple of slides. We, we have a section that, that describes it better. But basically, the idea of really getting down to the water and occupying a, a dynamic ecological zone is, is driving the design in this area. So without you know, going right into that, um, there will be different components of this shoreline. There will be parts of it that remain armored with uh, riprap, improved armoring over what we see there now. And then there will be parts that, that um, we want to establish plants and uh, more informal pathways and trails. Uh, the vision for it now is that it's really um, a gravelly beach and gravelly dunes that don't necessarily encourage people to go and sunbathe, but really you can go and explore. Uh, we are picturing something like this with, um, with logs and um, potentially pathways that could just sort of be found in this landscape. Other program elements throughout the site this the idea of restoring a, a native meadow type landscape on the um, west edge of the site. The idea of nature play and really having um, kind of a, a, a play um, environment that fits in with the, the, the shoreline, both ecologically and maybe some of the maritime heritage and also the lumber heritage of the site. So bringing in a lot of wood. Uh, the waterfront promenade idea that especially close to the southern shore, there's, there's um, the idea of pathways going through a more natural type of environment. And then of course the Bay Trail. The southern shoreline, um, the existing um, section is the one that I'm tracing with my cursor here. It's a little bit hard to see. But the idea is to lay back that shoreline and allow a much more gradual um, you know, inundation of that over time and allow tides to be perceived up and down this gravel beach. And then there's a what we're calling a transitional zone uh, where currently there's access, there would be a pathway running through it meandering and these gravel dunes and different uh, driftwood features. There's also um, a little harder uh, paved plaza space 
So different alternatives and opportunities for getting into and appreciating and experiencing the shoreline. And then that is all sort of constrained by the Bay Trail itself, which is at the uh, um, the 12.0 NAVD elevation. So that represents the 50 year um, sort of sea level rise elevation. The eastern edge of the site will see some significant change even while we're keeping the Halprin structure and the steps. Um, it's important to note, and you can see a little bit in this picture on the lower right, that currently there's a, there's a wall that projects up about three feet above grade. And then it is also retaining approximately two or three feet of soil uh, on the eastern edge of this, this pergola. And what it represents now is really a barrier. When you're up above in the pergola space or, or in, the, um, in the open lawn area to the uh, west of the pergola, the, the sense that this is an open access to the water is really um, um, broken by this very small feature, but it's a significant feature. So this design proposes to elevate the Bay Trail, and in doing so, we can get rid of that short retaining wall and take down the, the, the three-foot high wall above it and really open up this space, both visually, but even really physically, that it's just an easy, uh, there's easy access from the pergola out. And then there would be some paths that go down this sloped area down to the secondary um, pathway. So I think it's a small move, but a significant one in terms of the sense of being next to the water. Um, Shruti already described the sea level rise projections. This map just overlays our design and again reiterates that there is a part of it at least that would um, not need to be um, adapted at least theoretically through 2070. And then just one final slide that just uh, we are currently pursuing some grant funding to enhance the ecological aspects of this design. This is intertidal and subtidal zones. So um, the the human experience may, may be the, much the same. Uh, however, part of this grant money could also help us to um, expand on the ecological value of that so-called transitional zone as well. And if there are questions about that, um, feel free to ask, but I won't spend a lot of time on this. And we have our partners from ESA who've been working on the shoreline and, and can speak to a lot of the, um, both the sea level rise questions if those come up, and then also the, uh, the engineering and ecological aspects of the whole shoreline, uh, resilient nature-based shoreline design. That brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, that was excellent presentation. Uh, so let's move to clarifying questions on the presentation from the board. Um, why don't we just start from that end and come down? Um, Kristen, any questions to clarify? I was just wondering <coughs> where the Bay Trail, I was looking to the um, exhibits to see where exactly the Bay Trail connects off the site. Um, it looks like it connects around the boathouse and then just wondering what the quality of that connection is along the parking lot to get to the bridge. Along the, yeah, let me, um, let me see if the existing, there is the aerial photo here. I'm afraid we don't have a good photo in our exhibit, but it is paved. Um, and then there is a accessible route that's a ramp um, that gets you up to the sidewalk. And so that that exists as a connection. It is it's a big grade chain, so it's a it's one it's a ramp with handrails and a switchback and so on. Um, and then it's it's just a paved trail that runs down the uh, eastern edge of the site here. Does that answer your question? 
It does. Thank you. And I'm, you know, I apologies. I didn't get out to the site to check it out. I'm sure my uh, colleagues here have seen this in person, but I appreciate the explanation. And then just the one other question I had was, is the um, existing parking lot connected to the future parking lot or are those two separate? It looks like they're totally separate circulation systems. Yeah, thanks for asking that. I meant to point that out. Our diagram doesn't clarify that. Um, it does connect. Thank you so much. That's, those are my questions. Andrew. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a kind of related question about the parking. Is the parking within the park boundary? Because it, it seems like it sort of excluded the existing parking from the diagram. So I had a question about the that, the existing parking. And the second follow-up question to that was, how was the total amount of parking calculated that you needed the existing lot, which is, well, certainly currently it doesn't seem like it's that well utilized, but obviously the park is, is uh, not in great condition. So I'm just curious about the how the total amount of parking was calculated. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was, the, I'm sorry, the first question had to do with the existing parking. Yeah, is it in the park boundary? Oh, is it, it in park just, boundary? In your exhibit, it looks like it's sort of outside of the boundary because it's outside of the project limit, but is it actually within the park itself? Yes, I think technically speaking, the park boundary includes the JLAC and its associated parking and, and, and waterfront access. Um, we're defining the limit of work as being sort of within the technical park boundary as far as city of Oakland ownership and control is concerned. So this is part of the park. Um, JLAC has an agreement with the city of Oakland to occupy space within the park. Um, the, exist, the parking count, there is existing parking on the site. Uh, it, it runs generally north-south on the western edge of the property. It's accessed through this, there is an existing roadway that um, ends roughly here. Um, and then historically there was a larger parking area um, sort of south of the uh, cash and carry site. And basically the way it was calculated was to replace that existing parking more or less. I don't think, I don't have the exact parking counts on uh, off the top of my head, but basically it was to replace whatever was existing. Um, we are adding uh, spaces designed for boat trailers. Um, so it's it's an it's a replacement, but also you could say an enhancement of that parking for for boaters. Okay, thank you. So the parking that is adjacent to the JLAC building, that's counted as part of the park parking, though. The park the parking yes. that's on the east, yes, the northeast is. side of the site. It is, and it is technically available to the public. Okay, thank you for that. And the other question was, I wasn't sure that area that's in white in the middle of the site that's adjacent to the bathrooms, what is that exactly? I couldn't quite figure that out. This trapezoidal? Yes, exactly area. that. Right, so the bathroom facility is the square and then as part of the project to support the JLAC um, programs, which are essentially tenants of the city of Oakland, uh, the city will be building additional boat storage. So this is a boat storage yard it doesn't have a roof, but it's a fenced in um, yard with, with racks for the, for the rowing shells, and then also space for some city of Oakland boats that they use for youth programs. Thank you. That's my final question. Okay, thank you. Gary? Yeah, I've got a couple questions here. Um, you said that uh, it would be built as uh, funds become available can you explain to us what is going to be the first phase that would be built and then kind of related, uh, is there a plan? Can you say a few words about um, maintenance and how uh, that would be funded or organized? Well, the, the, what we are showing is what we're intending to build uh, within this, this boundary. So there isn't, isn't a phase two conceived right now. Um, there is a, a longer term master plan that includes some um, improvements to the JLAC site. And also if the funding comes through for the grant to um, enhance the shoreline, that could include the uh, Eastern shoreline as well. So that may be folded into the project funding um, dependent. 
And then there will need to be some additional funding in addition to what is currently earmarked for the project or budgeted for the project to support everything that we're showing. So this is a work in progress in terms of matching the, the construction budget to the funding. Things, things we're showing may need to change or, or, or um, we may need to change the limit of work depending on how funding is gonna come in. Okay. Understood. Thank you. And then finally, the um, LA of Trees, which is parallel to the Halpern Trellis, is that mm -hmm. LA of Trees being removed or replaced? You said something about changing the grade over there to raise yeah. the Bay Trail? Yes. So, so what, what's shown there. here would be a replace or new trees in that location. Uh, currently, there's a double row in LA, and, and those trees really are not doing well. I think the elevation's too low relative to the bay for that species. And so uh, currently we're just showing one row of trees that would be up at a, at a higher elevation. You, do you know uh, what are the trees that are existing and what they're being replaced with and what that we all is like? Yeah, the existing ones I believe are London Plains uh, for the most part. There's a few other species out there, but that LA I believe is London Plain. Uh, and we haven't done the, we haven't gotten into our planting design yet. Um, so we haven't identified the tree species. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tom? Hi, Jake. Hi. Nice to work with me. Um, two questions. Uh, one, uh, you didn't mention anything about large events, festivals, things like that, but it seems like this could be conducive. And I was wondering, what is the... Uh, attitude or what, what does the client think about that and do you think that could be a factor here? Yes, so the client does want to support large events, obviously balancing that with the uh, needs of the neighbors and so on and so forth with regard to noise and, and things like that. But yes, this is very much designed to um, accommodate events. So in particular, the connection of this event plaza and there's actually a grade change here so we're working to design it so that that even with the grade change uh, this feels like a connected plaza and that it can in turn connect to this big multi-use field and so if you wanted to put up tents and things or have a, a, a performance uh, that this this event plaza and field are connected in that way obviously also um, you know, the pergola could be used for events. They, on a smaller scale, uh, the city is interested in being able to rent the space and obviously to generate some revenue uh, for weddings or other similar smaller scale events. Um, but large events are, are, the design does support large events. Or that's the intent. One other quick thing. the condition of the existing plaza that number 13 there mm -hmm. uh, is it in need of renovation does it need additional amenities to kind of encourage certain types of activity or is it pretty much left as is yeah no it needs improvement um let me see if i can find this is it so this this round wall is a, is the edge of a big circular planter uh, and it was paved with decomposed granite, which is obviously in, in disrepair and full of weeds and so on. Um, our proposal is to pave it with hard pavement, either concrete or asphalt. Um, that would be a place for roller skaters and, and food trucks. Um, so it, it would be um, it would be changed. Um, we are just as a a side note, we're considering whether to keep this round planter or replace it or to partially keep it in place, um, but make it a more occupiable space. Uh, so that's in, in, the, in the works. Could I add a response to the, the question about events? Just, um, I think the scale of events and what we mean by a large event is, I think is a, is a is a nuance here, and there. And, and Jake, maybe you know, correct me if you have a strong, a different uh, outcome of this. Um, 
we looked at it for much larger festivals and it really wasn't going to be compatible with the adjacent neighbors. So there's not support structures for, you know, huge festivals, uh, music festivals, et cetera. The, the large event would be similar to, you know, a great Sunday afternoon at Brooklyn Basin with maybe some salsa over in the plaza um, and a lot of skating, um, feather boas, uh, the whole nine yards, but more in the plaza and then other picnic events and things under the under the pergola. And certainly we would see activities out on the lawn, but I think not the large festival. Yeah, I think that's right. And certainly not on a regular basis. This isn't the home for the annual, you know, whatever. <laughs> it, it would be special occasions. And, and, and again, you know, very much need to be coordinated with the adjacent neighbors. Your microphone is turned off. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Jake, I have a couple more questions. I was really interested to hear you mention that there's a master plan for the site because it seemed a little odd to me to not have some sort of resolution uh, that we could uh, see, uh, even if it's long term, around the uh, JLAC area and the parking lot. Is there a master plan that it would be possible for us to see? Yeah, the one I was referring to came out of an earlier design process. So there is, um, but it, the master plan has changed significantly since then. Um, so with regard to the rest of the site, I, I don't necessarily wanna spend a lot of time going into how it's changed, but the JLAC parking itself did have uh, a, a plan that um, accommodated uh, a different circulation through this and actually closed off the um, the existing uh, entry to the JLAC. And I, we didn't share it because it's it's not it's not much more than a, a, a redesign of the parking lot. So the JLAC building itself stays where it is and all of the access to all of the boating facilities stay where they are. So if you're asking about a longer term vision that addresses uh, sea level rise and, and um, really changes this, this part of the site, that's, that's not what's shown in the master plan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, the next question uh, is about the two entries and the existing entry is quite a, um, quite a formal entry, uh, very clear as you're driving along that it's a, a main entry point. Uh, is the second entry point intended to have a similar uh, hierarchy or is it more of a secondary entry point? It's an excellent question. And I think the answer is it, it is intended to have a similar level of presence and hierarchy. There should be, a, there will be a major monument sign uh, announcing the park and that would be at this new entry. Um, and to be honest, I think that since you asked the question, uh, that part of this design could be developed further so that it's obvious when you're looking at the plan. But that is the intent. Yeah, okay, thank you. And look, this is a, a sort of a smaller question, but uh, you know, there is the heritage of the Halperin design. And I found the community tables and benches quite an interesting part of the seating underneath the pergola. And I just note on this drawing that the, the, the configuration of the tables, the long picnic tables is differently oriented. And I was just wondering if that was intentional or um, diagrammatic at this stage. I can answer that. It's diagrammatic at this, at this point. Mm -hmm. We know that they're in disrepair. Um, they're not accessible, but there's also something compelling about the length uh, of those forms and, and the weight of those materials, combining um, Halpern's influence and the weight that was used at, at that time period, even with the overlay of the sunset lumber, there's there's going to be some interesting language that will uh, that will come out of that um, budget provided, yeah. for sure. Okay, thank you very much. I think that uh, that. Um, closes out the clarifying questions from the board. Uh, so with that, we'll move on to public comment. And I'm just gonna read a little bit to remind people of the process here. So uh, 
We'll open the meeting to public comment now. Uh, any member of the public attending the meeting in person, please notify the board secretary if you would like to make a comment. If you're attending online and would like to make a comment, please raise your virtual hand to speak. Remember, if you are joining our meeting via phone, you must press star nine on your keypad to raise your hand to make a comment. To unmute or mute, um, press star six. You will be called in the order that your hand was raised and you will have three minutes to speak. Ashley will note when you have one minute remaining. Please state your name and affiliation for the record at the beginning of your comment. As mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, if you would like to add your contact information to the interested parties list to be notified of future meetings concerning this project, please call or email Andrea Gaffney. Okay. Um, I have received um, several public comments um, since the agendizing of the meeting, um, and I'm not going to read them verbatim. They'll go into the record along with the meeting minutes. Um, I believe I emailed them all to the board members, and I'll send them to the project proponents if they haven't been shared already. Um, the first one is from the Bay, excuse me, the Bay Trail um, from Lee Wo. Um, he references uh, issues by topic. Um, first one is Bay Trail connections. Um, and the importance of the connections. The second is Bay Trail capacity um, and considering the width of the Bay Trail. Um, third is the impacts of events and gatherings and how those affect the Bay Trail. Um, fourth references uh, water activity impacts. Um, the fact that it doesn't seem to propose any new water activities and how they interact and potentially cross with the Bay Trail. Um, fifth issue is trail amenities. Um, have some questions about the existing restrooms versus the new ones. Um, and the sixth comment is related to trail design um, and about the 90 degree corner turn in the southern corner um, and how this could be softened for uh, bicycle flow traffic. So um, this will be included in the meeting minutes as he wrote it out. Um, so the next two comments um, were received by William Threlfall. Um, one was, um, I believe, a, a personal comment from him. I see that he's on the call tonight, so if he would like to speak, um, go ahead and please raise your hand. But otherwise, I'll just note the comments. Um, the first email that we received regarded the um, comments about the public launch and how this is a waterfront park and that it seems that a public launch would be an important element. Um, there's not a public launch anywhere else in the Brooklyn Basin Development Project that he is mentioning. Um, the second comment that he discusses is uh, about resilient design um, and protecting the park um, and the improvements in the park against misuse and uh, references encampments um, and new improvements. The other comment that we received from William Throwfall um, was written as the chair of the Estuary Park Plan Study Group that was appointed by the Oakland Measure DD Community Coalition. Um, and the study, he, says in this one, the study group has developed a set of questions and comments about the emergent, emerging estuary park plan and has been seeking responses by city staff and the designers. Um, the document that he included is the list of questions and comments um, that, he has, um, that the group has put to the city and the designers. So I believe I sent you that one as well. Um, it's 12 pages, has a series of questions um, about the design, and I think they're um, relative, relevant to the discussions that we're having tonight. Um, so if you want me to go into those further or put them up on the screen, just let me know. Um, and then, oh yeah, no, I think that's it. That's all we received for this project um, on email. And I think- Andrea, I have one question. Sure. Um, uh, mentioned Outdoor Cafe, the uh, Ron Lee, uh, Lee Huo. Lee Huo. 
Item three, outdoor cafe. I don't know. Where is the outdoor cafe? We don't, we don't see it on the plan. Um, well, there were two comments from Lee. Uh, so he, he sent one for um, Peninsula Crossing as well. So I think that that's the one you're looking, looking at. Long, yeah, you're looking at the wrong one. So, yeah, I almost read it too. So yeah, that's for the next project. Uh, I don't believe there is an outdoor cafe proposed uh, at Estuary Park yet. So, um, okay, so now we'll move on to live public comment with Ashley. Tom Horton, your audio is unmuted. Please state your name and affiliation and you have three minutes to speak. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Tom Horton <clears throat> and I'm the volunteer boathouse manager with the Jack London Aquatic Center, specifically for the East Bay Rowing Club and Oakland Technical High School Juniors Rowing Club. Um, I first just wanted to compliment the WRT design team for the estuary plan. Um, it's, a, it's a very creative and responsive plan to the many constraints and opportunities of the site. So um, the rowing clubs that occupy Jack Lennon Aquatic Center are very appreciative of the time and effort spent in developing the plan. Um, I also want to thank the City of Oakland for the collaborative environment that they established to allow both the current and the future users of Estuary Park and the Jack Lennon Aquatic Center area um, for the collection of public comments and the uh, opportunity to talk about the various uses, both current and future, of the site. I did want to just react to one comment, and that was about the, the kind of derelict quality of Estuary Park. And that it is true that the park has been underutilized and under um, and subject to uh, a, a significant amount of degradation through lack of maintenance by the city. Um, and we're hoping that this new design will turn that around. I did want to highlight, though, the, um, the significant activity um, around the JLAC building in the eastern corner of the park, which unfortunately is outside of this project. Um, and that is on any given day, there are um, upwards of four, 400 um, youth and adult um, aquatic users that utilize the site so that multiple days a week, the parking lot that was mentioned in the upper right-hand corner of the plan is completely full of vehicles. So this is, is a very active part of um, the park and it will continue to be both now and into the future. And so while it's not part of the plan, um, Jack Lennon Aquatic Center really is the jewel in the crown of this development and far and away attracts the most public use currently to the site, which we anticipate to only get more active as the Brooklyn Basin project continues to expand. So I just wanted to add that comment to note that aquatic activities, whether they be rowing or dragon boating, or public use of the launch ramp um, continues to be one of the most um, uh, largest draws to the aquatic center. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we don't have any more hands raised online. So I think that's the end of public comment. Unless there's anyone here. Okay, thank you, Andrea, and uh, thank you to those who commented uh, either in writing or uh, online here tonight. So uh, at this point, we'll move to board discussion and advice, which is really a, a dialogue uh, between the, the board. And uh, I, I will just open it up by saying you know, this is a very significant and very exciting project because you know, this is a key part of the waterfront. Uh, in Oakland. It's a very important gateway uh, park uh, uh, for, for Oakland. And, and, uh, and I think uh, the fact that this is coming forward as a project is, is and, and that the city is committed to it, the community uh, level of community engagement is, is very, very um, encouraging. So with that, I want to thank everyone for the work they've put into it to date. Uh, I've got to say I was very uh, encouraged just to hear Tom Horton speak because I'm sure the board will share this. It's, it's, uh, it was a little uh, difficult to really compose the entire picture of uh, the level of use of this area with the 
you know, the, the dotted red line uh, uh, to to the south of JLAC and, and the very high use of the water's edge along there. It seems like the complete picture really needs uh, a critical stakeholder like JLAC and all of the all of those users uh, to really be part of it. And I imagine that has been happening uh, through the community meetings, but it, it was interesting not to see the rowing users and represented at the level I thought that uh, they would be. So having said that, uh, I, um, you know, I, I just feel like there's a missing hole. It's adjacent to the project that we're reviewing right now, but uh, I think it would be very helpful to uh, just see some even diagrammatic, uh, you know, illustration of, of how the Bay Trail connects, and you know what the what the bigger impact of JLAC, JLAC is um, on the park. So I'm going to stop there and just open this up to discussion, and we will try and structure this um, to the objectives that we follow each meeting. And the first of those is to make sure the public uh, access is, is really public and very usable, and that visual access to the bay and the shoreline is maintained, that the visual quality of the bay shoreline is uh, an adjacent development is enhanced and maintained, uh, putting attention into the con connections, and in this case, very critical connections uh, for the bay trail. This was uh, a, a very important um, part of the bay trail in, this, uh, in Oakland. Uh, and then um, taking advantage, of course, of the base setting and looking at wildlife um, or habitat, uh, you know, through siting, design and management strategies. So we had two questions uh, that the staff had asked us to think about and we got some clarification during the presentation on, you know, what scale of special events there would be um, and just how that would potentially uh, relate to the day-to-day public enjoyment of the, of the park, so if people can make some reference to that as you speak, that would be good. And then uh, just advising on the proposed redesign for the southern waterfront uh, with the bay trail shifting upland and the incorporation of the transition zone, the gravel beach and the tidal pool structures. And quite often, you know, we're, we're really encouraging people to bring the bay trail as close to the edge as possible, but this is a, a very interesting proposal. So. I, so there are those two questions to comment on, but I think I'd just like each of you to you know, make some comment and we can just uh, react to that. Um, Tom, I'm going to ask you to kick off, if that's okay. Tom, sorry, I stepped away from the mic here, but why don't you kick off? Yeah, I think we heard already on events enough to satisfy my curiosity about it's not really desirable because there's housing right next door. A lot of complaints if there were big events, probably. Um, I have two areas to comment on. One is that um, I think before you get a call from uh, Charles Birnbaum, it might be a good idea to, he's head of the Cultural Landscape Foundation and he has, uh, he'll be interested in this, so it might be good to, to develop a little more systematic assessment of, of, of the Halperin project and kind of elaborate and kind of rationalize, justify uh, making moves that would, that would change it, like removing the wall and, and removing the trees, which do create a barrier, and some of the other benefits that it brings is that 50 years later. Um, second thing is there's, there's a lot of uh, water being used here, I fear, and uh, I'm just wondering what, what measures could be brought, uh, ways of... Uh, Kind of strategically allocating water for big, I mean, it's a great big turf area, which is great, of course, but there, this is another thing that kind of generates uh, resistance, I think, down the road, potentially. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to follow up. I, I, that was a comment I was going to make, too, I think, and especially in light of the um, you know, the condition that the park is in right now, I think maintenance is front and center. I, I think we all know that it's a huge issue, you know, with, with water and the, and the cost of maintenance and knowledgeable people to do it. And the, in terms of the public's enjoyment of this park, having that lawn 
not just alive but in really good shape, I think would be really crucial for public events or not for public events. So that, that really does stand out. It's a very, very uh, ambitious um, thing to do a lawn that big and I think we know that trees take the least maintenance and ground covers take the most maintenance and water. So uh, I do think that is something that I don't usually ask about maintenance. I don't even know if it's in our purview, but I, I think it's really crucial to the success of waterfront landscapes. Um, the one other thing I wanted to mention is about the question of the Bay Trail being raised and all that. I think sectionally and all that, it, it seems, I mean, I'd love to see the section on the, on the screen if that's possible, but um, usually we see a, a 2100 um, adaptation plan for sea level rise, and I think you're taking it to 2070. So, you know, I presume this project will be back, and hopefully we can talk about that in more detail. What, what options does the City of Oakland have for um, preserving more of the park and access to at least a portion of the park? Thank you. Could you go back to the overall plan? Thank you for your presentation for the park design. I think as we've all said, this is a really exciting opportunity for Oakland, um, especially given the current conditions of the park and this new development that's happening to the east and this connectivity to Jack London Square. So it's really exciting to see this all come together. And I'm really glad that the Halperin Pergola is being kept as part of the park. I think it is a, a really interesting feature and provides shade and has interesting structure and light patterns that come from the way the roof structure works. And I think it's just to mention those benches and tables are really quite interesting now. They're kind of length and the sort of almost monumentality of them. Um, so one area that I think could use some further development is just to the southeast of that. There's that funny little kind of pier projection and it feels like there's, you've got this Halprin pergola, and then you have this more natural landscape, and then the Bay Trail making this 90 degree turn all in that area. And I feel like that there's maybe a missed opportunity with what's happening on that little little square that's there. Because it's kind of like you're coming, and you, if you think about riding from Jack London Square on a bike, let's say, it's a place where you would suddenly want to probably stop and pause and turn. But it feels a little unresolved in how all those things come together the natural landscape, the historic Halpern piece, these new components, um, the Bay Trail. So I think, and I think we had a public comment also, I think it was about that 90 degree turn there. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, one area that I feel uh, could use more weaving together. And um, can I go on next to the second question? Is it okay to talk about the moving the... Yeah, and look, I'll just make a, can yeah. I just build on that sure. comment? Yeah. Um, I think that's a really important point. Uh, it's a popular fishing spot. Right. And when I was there on the weekend, there were quite a few people fishing. But but it does seem it could be resolved. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on in that corner, in that corner and I think uh, it would be very interesting to see that study for, further and to see if there could be a sort of cleaner... Um, uh, transition, uh, particularly around the corner, but with all the secondary paths and, you know, the, it looks a little diagrammatic still at this yeah. point. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. And I was just going to say, I actually like the Bay Trail being moved, um, I guess being moved northward, giving more space to the, the sort of adaptation zone and that natural kind of beachy landscape. I think that will be really popular. And I think it's a really nice contrast from the much more uh, hardened edge of Jack London Square. If you think a lot of people will make this whole route as part of a walking or biking trail, and this is just a very different experience uh, being able to get down to the water. So I, I really think it's a good, I, I like that more. I think it's a really good move in this, in this particular situation. Yeah, you know, we see so many armored walls along the edges of our parks, and to see this proposal, I think it's very, uh, you know, it's it's what we want to see, you know, more uh, natural shoreline, uh, you know, and so uh, I really applaud the intent of this move. Um, you know, I just had a couple of other things that struck me. Um, one is security, and uh, there was a comment made that Jake made during the presentation about, you know, people driving in and partying and... And when you walk around the park, there's clearly evidence of, 
you know, but, but people do a lot of things like that. And uh, in the park renovation, I just encourage, as this, as this design continues to develop, I just feel like figuring out how to make this more secure um, and how the knowing that this may get some pretty intense use, really thinking about how plant material furnishings, surface materials, all of that are, are really sort of selected and developed in the design because uh, it would be a tragedy to see this park upgraded and then to see it deteriorate very quickly. So, you know, if we could learn more about how security, safety and security in the park uh, will take place, that, that would be good. Um, and then the next thing that I, I'm really glad, Tom, that you picked up that point about Halperin because I feel like there's an opportunity here to make some, certainly be very thoughtful about what changes and what doesn't change. Um, Charles is coming. Right. And, you know, even the picnic tables, Andrew, you mentioned those. I mean, they really struck me as something that, even if they had to be replaced, I would try and mimic the position and the orientation of those. Um, they would try and, you know, renovate them if possible. Um, the, uh, I also think the Bay Trail, uh, the connection up over the, the, the bridge at the, um, at the uh, northern end is actually quite, you know, recently done, quite good con condition. Uh, there is a sign uh, signing the Bay Trail up uh, on the northern end of the existing parking lot at JPAC, but I do think that there should be some effort made to, to make sure that the Bay Trail, which was number one in the community's response is, is signed well, that there's good interpretation associated with it. You know, this is a place where I think, uh, you know, we should make, uh, make sure that the Bay Trail is not only physically uh, constructed at the scale it should be at, but and located in a way that it can be easily used, but the appropriate signage is there for it as well. Uh, uh, so that struck me, as well as potentially interpretation of Halper, um, because, uh, of all of Halperin's work around the bay, uh, you know, not many, not much of his work survives. Not much to see anymore. Yeah, yeah. So something to, to uh, think about. Um, the boat storage struck me that it seemed like, and, and even the restrooms, it made me really wonder whether the JPAC interface, sorry, <laughs> JPAC interface, uh, could be, I just wasn't sure if, if that had all been coordinated properly. You know, could the restrooms be somehow attached to the J-like building um, rather than being independent? Um, does the boat storage need to be there or could it be extending out the existing boat storage? I presume there's a lot of coordination on that, but it just struck me that it was a little bit piecemeal and I... Um, would encourage more thought goes into that. Um, talked about the two entry points. Um, security. Yeah, I think that was it. It would be good, as we would normally see at a future review, to see details of how lighting and, um, and you know, other furnishings are going to be handled because this park will get a lot of use. I think it's... Ex uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think it's exciting that that plaza can accommodate food trucks and uses like that. I think that's a real positive and good relationship to the parking lot. Yeah, and be able to drive on and yeah. hose it down and things like that. Yeah. Anyway, I just, I just want to further uh, support what you're saying about needing to get the whole picture, the whole story yeah. about how these things work together. Next time it comes, it really has to kind of consider the whole thing as one, you know, integrated facility for sure. Yeah. Um, and the last one, is there any possibility for uh, generating revenue on the site through rentals, through whatever uh, whatever kind of maintenance there might be, and that uh, money can be potentially used to help fund the maintenance, which is always hard to find money. City budget. Yeah, great point. And the guide underscore what Tom Horton said, uh, even on the weekends, uh, you know, there are people pumping up their, um, their uh, 
craft to use that public. There's a really good, good quality public launch point there, really impressive. And so, again, that sort of cross use, people in the park being able to use, you know, make access into the water, utilizing the existing structures is, is part of the story of the park. And I'm not sure it's all very coherent at the moment. <laughs> I don't know if you're done. Yeah, I'm done. I just I wanted to build on a few of the comments too. Um, I agree it would be really helpful to see a master plan specifically understanding how the JLAC facility is used and because it is so intensely used, um, how would connection to the Bay Trail be preserved when there's boats coming in and out of the water, if there's a regatta, or just understanding a little bit more about that dynamic. Um, also understanding kind of even bigger picture, what are the opportunities for events along this whole shoreline? It's so amazing to see how many, you know, from Jack London all the way around to Brooklyn Basin, there's so many things coming online on this waterfront. Having grown up in Alameda, this is like this, amazing to see this waterfront come alive in this way. Also having been a rower, you know, it's amazing to see the facilities here really being supported with the storage and I'm sure those showers will be really appreciated by the rowers. Um, but understanding, you know, if there are opportunities for events elsewhere or if this is kind of the best opportunity for events, I would hate to see that revenue generating opportunity lost because there's some apartments next door. You know, that could be a wonderful part of living here is you can go, to, you know, maybe not every weekend, but maybe there's some really great events that could happen here that could generate revenue for maintenance. Um, or maybe that's happening somewhere else and this isn't the spot, but it would be good to understand that. And then um, I also agreed with you, Jacinta, on the like movements of the, I was imagining carrying that eight, you know, into that boathouse and what actually are the, looks like you have to walk into the parking lot and around through the doors in the back, which is kind of a long circuitous way to go. That's obviously a detail, but, you know, thinking about those movements and then again, thinking about boat trailers. Um, there's some parking for boat trailers in that new parking lot wondering how much of that should be happening, is going to be happening in the JLAC parking lot versus this parking lot. It seems like there's a lot of ideas about accommodations for the, the rowing, which is fantastic, but not I'm not exactly sure which is, you know, what's happening where in the kind of bigger picture. I think that'd be helpful to understand. And then, um, sort of a grab bag here, but that 90 degree turn at the bottom, I appreciated what you said about the resolution of that. And I think, um, there's also, uh, I, I think that 90 degree turn actually is a great little cue for cyclists and rollerbladers and such to kind of slow down as they come into an area that might have more kind of cross traffic from the shore to the picnic area. You could imagine kids running back and forth. And um, I know this is a very conceptual level that you guys are at right now. But as you bring it forward, it'd be great to see how you're thinking about those cues because this sounds like there is a lot of rollerblading and biking kind of through movement and the beauty of the Bay Trail being that it connects all of these places. Um, how do you think about that kind of queuing of those modes as they interact? Um, and then uh, also just building on Gary's comment about the 2100, um, the building to the year 2100. The only thing that I would think would be most important to build to the year 2100 would be the bathroom structures, just because those are so hard to come back later and build up higher. So making sure that buildings are out of the, you know, 100-year flood zone in the short term and out of the longer term floodplain, that seems like the, if you're going to make an investment in that one place, that could really help the very long-term viability of the park, because those restrooms are such important features in these parks. You know, it lets people stay there so much longer. Um, so that would just be a suggestion. You know, I know it's expensive and all of that, but that would be the one place that I would recommend. And then the last point is um, the just the connection to the sidewalk on the Embarcadero um, and just thinking about, you know, more. So much of the park is focused towards the water side, but there's very little pedestrian connectivity on the northern end as it meets the Embarcadero. So little, so few opportunities to enter the park. Mostly I see opportunities for cars um, and it's not as clear, you know, there's that one 
road, which we're, you know, it sounds like that'll stay. It sounds like there might be some improvements coming um, towards the Brooklyn Basin end. You know, maybe there's a spot for one, one or two more sidewalk connections for people coming in um, from the street. Um, and then I guess the last point is just I love how many different edges there are here, how many different opportunities there are to touch the water and be interact with the water in different ways. I think this is a really, uh, you know, in my very short time on the DRB, I think this has the most kind of waterfront activation opportunities. You know, you could put every kind of craft in here. You could put in a sub, a kayak, a rowboat, you know, a, a, the, a motorboat at the deeper end. You know, there's just so many ways to kind of interact with the water. So I just, I think that's really fantastic. You know, I just had, that just reminded me of something else. Um, you know, as the design develops, uh, providing a lot of seating there. Um, interestingly, you know, I, I think that original Halperin stepped seating edge to the water on the northern side is a fantastic asset to the park. It's, it's really great. Um, but I think we should keep in mind, particularly for um, accessible seating uh, and making sure that there is sufficient seating and shaded seating and sufficient trees to provide some shade um, will be really important. This place, you know, this gets very hot. In fact, those parking lots, um, you know, it, people come and park their car and just enjoy sitting here as well. And um, so just considering shade uh, in this park, I think, will be really important. Okay. I think that's a wrap. I think that's probably our discussion, Andrea. Uh, so having concluded that, um, I think I don't think I'll re-summarize the recommendations. I think we've got notes on that and our thoughts. Uh, there's obviously a lot more design development to happen. So I'm very glad that you've come in at this um, earlier stage of design to uh, have this dialogue. Uh, so that concludes uh, our comments for now. Um, would the project team like to respond? I'd be happy to. John Gibbs, WRT. Um, yeah, thank you for just a compelling conversation and, and kind of recognizing where we are in the process, landing major elements uh, on, on this waterfront, um, recognizing where we are in a, in a string of really interesting, dynamic places along the Oakland waterfront. And this has been a park for, you know, obviously decades, um, but, you know, has, has marginally functioned as such, with the exception of the JLAC building and the rowing and the aquatics uh, programs that are there. And, um, you know, I think it was, it was great, uh, Tom speaking here in the, in the audience and you guys really picking up and, and recognizing, you know, what, a, what an amazing asset that is. And really it's, its success is part of the reason that we're, you know, didn't emphasize it as, as part of this presentation. The other reason is, is the budget. Um, and if you look at sea level rise projections, there's some significant work that's going to need to occur in that part of the project. But it's functioning right now. The Bay Trail exists and is clear. Um, the, the staging areas around the building really work. The parking lot works. You know, it's, it's the functioning thing. Um, it's, it's the other pieces around it that really need to be brought up to some level. And so that's really, for budget purposes, et cetera, that's, you know, that's really the, the emphasis here as part of this project and, and to expand the park. Um, you know, thinking about activation, this has been um, a really big conversation um, with the Measure DD coalition and others in the community. You know, how do we activate this park? How do we design for longevity, for maintenance? These are, these are really big questions that we're, we're grappling with. And I think, you know, many of us know that challenge of designing in a public environment and in a maintenance scarce environment as well. So, um, you know, I think you'll continue to see big moves. You're going to see simplicity of materials and durability. Um, not relying on extensive intricate planting that um, really can't be maintained. Um, you know, we talked about water use, and you know, I think we would all want to really think about 
um, you know, are we putting water where there's where there's activity? Um, and in in this instance, you know, the the active soccer programs that are happening on the lawn area, you know, that's sort of what you know how we're how we're justifying that. Um, but you know, water use is you know it's it's something that we're we're grappling with in in all of our landscapes and all of our public areas. And um, the there was a lot of interesting work sizing this small enough that we were minimizing the amount of area that was irrigated, but large enough that it accommodated all the soccer activities. Again, we didn't get into that because that's a little bit in the, in the interior of the, of the park. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of interesting things to, um, to come back to, you know, if, if, if we're going to um, visit this again um, with a little bit more detail. And I don't want to respond to, you know, all the little places. I think there's lots of good insights that you guys have had. Just one plug for uh, one plug for Halprin, um, you know, earlier uh, reviews had really had minimized uh, the research that was done for CEQA purposes, really had minimized the influence of Halprin. The structure wasn't going to be retained by um, in previous design iterations by a previous consultant on the project. Um, but, you know, we think that it's a really compelling element and to remove something that is so character defining um, just really doesn't make sense to spend the money to even remove something when budget's uh, a constraint. So um, I think, you know, moving forward, we have some work to do to, to continue to, to celebrate that, to recognize that. Um, and, and, you know, I think we'll want to further document, you know, our understanding from, um, you know, from the folks that have done the research um, and provide a little bit more background around the, the historic versus important um, kind of legal definitions of some of those elements. But in the meantime, yeah, it's a, it's a really um, unique component of this, uh, of this project, and, and I think, you know, we all agree on it, why, why it's here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, that concludes the um, project proponent response. Um, we're going to take a five-minute break at this point, and then we'll come back and we will uh, start our review of the next project, which is the Peninsula Crossing project. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we have the recording turned back on, and we're going to get started. Uh, board is ready. Board is almost ready. Okay. Okay, thanks, Andrea. We're now going to begin our re review on agenda item five, which is the first review of the Peninsula Crossing project located at 1200 to 1340 Old Bayshore Highway in Burlingame, San Mateo County. And we'll just run through the order again. We'll start with the staff introduction, followed by the project proponent presentation, followed by the board clarifying questions, public comment, board discussion and summary, and then we'll wrap up with the project proponent response, a brief response. So with that, um, BCDC Permanent Analyst Catherine Pan will introduce the project. Thank you, Catherine. All right, thank you, Chair McCon, and uh, good evening, board members. I'm Catherine Pan, a Principal Shoreline Development Analyst at BCDC. And before I present the staff introduction, I would just like to remind the project team and staff to please turn on your video when you're speaking or answering questions. Uh, when you're not actively engaged with the board, please turn off your video so that we can minimize distractions on the screen. Uh, and now I'm happy to introduce the project for tonight's review. This is the first review of the Peninsula Crossing Project in the city of Burlingame in San Mateo County. The proposed project is located at 1200 to 1340 Old Bayshore Highway, where it intersects with Airport Boulevard. It's sandwiched between Highway 101 and the Bay, about a mile south of San Francisco International Airport. It's in the city's bayfront area, which has been locally designated as a regional recreation and business destination. 
Uh, much of the surrounding development in this area is commercial or industrial, but to the southeast, uh, you can find some recreational facilities and also the Anza Lagoon. Um, and then to the south, uh, some residential development as well. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the majority of the land in this area was once water and historic tidal flats located near Salsen, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatesh Ohlone. We offer gratitude to the indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of the bountiful natural resources of the Bay Area. Uh, here is some local context for parks and public access areas along the shoreline. These are shown in blue with the existing Bay Trail alignment in red. Uh, this northern segment uh, connects the coastline up to the airport, uh, and the southern segment continues uh, on past the lagoon. The site is about 12 acres in size and is developed. Staff visited the southern portion of the site during the day on Friday, May 6th of this year, and here's some photos from that visit. Some important site features that you'll hear more about later are Easton Creek, uh, which flows west to east across the site, cutting it uh, almost in two, um, and a small tidal channel at the southern end of the site. This is what uh, that looked like on our visit. Uh, on the bay side, the site borders a partially submerged parcel that contains most of the shoreline, which is rocky and muddy in this area, and that parcel is not a part of the project site. Existing public access includes informal access to the adjacent shoreline parcel. Uh, so you can see you can kind of cross uh, the vegetation here or access from a parking lot um, up at the hotel. And so you can see some people we uh, met while we were there. Uh, so segments of the Bay Trail run both north and south of the site, uh, but not through the site. Uh, and to give a little more context, here's a video of a walkthrough staff did back in April 2018. Uh, site conditions are roughly the same then as they are now. Um, the video starts at the southern end and walks north to uh, Easton Creek. Um, so sorry, it's a little bumpy there. Uh, so here's that tidal channel. Um, had some water there at the time. Uh, moving north along the site, that's a little... Uh, bumpy, this is a time-lapse video, uh, but here we're moving up um, along the hotel. You can see the shoreline from here. Uh, and then there's Easton Creek, uh, where it opens up into the bay, and then a little bench that is currently there, uh, and that's uh, the view north. Uh, and then we're also fortunate to be able to show you this view from the bay side, uh, which Andrea was able to capture from San Francisco Airport, but her, her flight took off last week. Um, so there's like a square shape there in the middle that's like moving slightly off now. Um, that is uh, the one Bay Plaza building, uh, which you might have seen in the exhibits. And that site is just that space between that last tall square building and then the um, the trees. That's where the bay trail starts. So fortunately can't show you with my little hand. Let me see. Nope. Um, so here's what our community vulnerability mapping tool shows us about the area. Uh, the site is in a census block group that's identified as having low social vulnerability and lower contamination vulnerability. Social vulnerability indicators in the 70th percentile include percentage of renters and non-U.S. citizens. Contamination vulnerability in this area is related to potential groundwater contamination and impaired water bodies. Uh, both are measured in the 80th percentile range, uh, as well as proximity to solid waste and hazardous waste facilities. Those, those are to a lesser degree. Um, and regarding potential sea level rise, uh, using current site elevations, this map shows what 24 inches of sea level rise would look like if the site remained unchanged. Uh, using the Ocean Protection Council's 2018 sea level rise guidance, 24 inches of sea level rise is equivalent to the mean high or high water under the medium to high risk aversion slash high emission scenario at mid-century. Uh, at this level, there is some potential for overtopping on the site, as indicated by this red line at the tidal channel, um, as well as some flooding along the channel and along the creek. There. 
Uh, and this map shows what 66 inches of sea level rise would look like uh, if the site was unchanged. This roughly corresponds to the mean higher high water level at 2090 in the medium to high risk aversion high emission scenario, as well as the 100 year storm condition at mid century. In this scenario, nearly the entire site would be flooded with overtopping occurring at both the creek and tidal channel. In fact, the flooding at the project site would be part of a much larger flooding impact that would affect most of the surrounding shoreline. So as much as it is a site-specific issue here, uh, it's a regional one as well. So this extends well up the coastline. The SFDI Adaptation Atlas identifies uh, nature-based adaptation opportunities along the shoreline. Uh, and these are areas that are well suited for interventions or actions that can help both address flooding and provide ecological benefits. At the project site, the atlas indicates suitability for beaches along the shoreline, that's the yellow, uh, eelgrass offshore, that's the green hatch, tidal marsh along the shoreline, and at the creek and tidal channel, uh, that's in green. Uh, the orange indicates areas that could be suitable to uh, prepare for habitat migration, which shows up in patches along the shoreline of this project site, um, may not be super visible at this scale. Uh, the City of Burlingame recently adopted a zoning ordinance that establishes requirements for new construction within commercial and industrial zoning districts within the sea, sea level rise overlay area, just shown in yellow here on the city's map of future conditions. Uh, the project site is subject to these requirements, which include that the lowest building finished floor elevation of new development shall be at least three feet above the FEMA-based flood elevation at the time the project application is complete. And because the property fronts the bay, new construction at the site must include shoreline infrastructure where the top of the infrastructure is six feet above the base flood elevation. Um, so before we introduce the project proponents, I'd like to quickly summarize the uh, questions in the staff report that we'd like the board to consider in your review. Uh, first, please consider how this project meets the public access objectives provided in BCDC's public access design guidelines. Uh, then staff has identified some specific questions we'd like to ask the board about uh, the design at this stage. Um, and these are, one, uh, how, does the public, or how does the project proposal result in public spaces that feel public, and does the project proposal allow for the shoreline to be enjoyed by the greatest number of people? Two, are there additional improvements that could improve the public access experience along the shoreline and the creek? And three, are the public access areas appropriately designed to be resilient and adaptive to sea level rise in balance with ensuring high quality public access opportunities? Um, all right, so I want to check to see if the board has any clarifying questions for me on anything presented in this introduction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Nothing here. Nothing? I don't think so. That was a very clear presentation. Thank you. Great. Uh, so now I'll introduce the project team to tell you more about the proposal. Uh, today we have Virginia Calkins and Seth Bland from Divco West, uh, Kevin Conjure and Justin Aff from CMG, Ben Mickis from WRNS Studio, Philip Trevetti from Moffat and Nickel, and David Bowlby, a community consultant. Um, and now I'll pass it over to Seth to begin their presentation. Give Please. us a moment to uh, yeah. <laughs> to get this presentation up. We're having some technical difficulties. Chair McCann, board, 
staff and members of the public, my name is Seth Bland, and I'm very pleased to be here this evening with my DIVCO West colleague, Virginia Calkins, uh, with Kevin Conger from CMG Landscape Architects, and with Ben Micus of WRNS Studio, our project architect. Also joining via Zoom is Dilip Trevetti of the engineering firm Moffat & Nickel. In the event your board has specific questions related to our resilient new bayfront infrastructure, and Kirk Syme of Woodstock Development, one of our very valued partners on this project. Our entire team welcomes this opportunity to share details of the transformative project we refer to as Peninsula Crossing, and we look forward to your thoughtful questions and commentary. Virginia will first provide a bit of team and site background, and she'll in turn invite Kevin to the podium to present the balance of that which we feel your board will be most interested. Virginia? Thank you, Seth. Um, I'll start with a quick background of who we are. There we go. Okay. I'll start with a quick background of who we are. Divco West is a national real estate company founded and nearly 30 years later, still firmly rooted here in the Bay Area. This is our home and given our long commitment to making great places here and across the country, we're excited to contribute meaningfully to BCDC's mission and vision with Peninsula Crossing. Our site is shown on the screen is a 12 acre bayfront parcel in Burlingame where we aim to set the standard for development in the region with a life science cluster and a transformative public realm. We have a unique opportunity to fill in an entirely missing section of Bay Trail, creating for the first time a continuous connection from SFO south to beyond Burlingame. We take the responsibility of Bayfront development very seriously and have prioritized public access and other BCDC shoreline development principles throughout the development of our design. Our project includes new recreational zones, enhanced native habitat, over a quarter mile of bay trail, bike and pedestrian connections, and adaptive sea level rise protection. New public paths and a welcome plaza will connect Old Bayshore Highway to the bayfront, drawing the community to experience the bay. Peninsula Crossing aims to build upon the regional bay trail network in nearby park space, complementing the already robust recreational opportunities in the area. We will contribute to the region's accessibility, open space, and sustainability with the Bay Trail stitching Peninsula Crossing to baseball fields across the street and other recreational zones along the Bay. We are investing in helping the public from a broad range of neighborhoods to access the site. The site is walking distance to the Broadway Caltrain station, and additionally, we are committed to funding a commute.org shuttle, which will provide free public rides to the Millbrae, Caltrain, and BART station every 15 minutes during peak hours. The improved network of bike and pedestrian paths will further increase accessibility. For those coming by car, we'll have 40 dedicated public spaces in our southern garage. The reason we use the word transformative to describe Peninsula Crossing might become a little more clear here with the images of the site today. It's largely paved, otherwise occupied by low-rise commercial buildings. There's no public access to the bay. It's one of the few locations where the Bay Trail simply stops. If visiting the site today, you'll inevitably see bikers and pedestrians, including those from neighboring hotels, wandering the parking lots, looking you know, through, through the bay mud as the BCDC staff experienced just a few weeks ago. Uh, for further context, this diagram shows Peninsula Crossing relative to the adjacent property owners, where you can see that the coastline itself is owned by an unrelated private entity. Our project respects these property lines and so does not impact that site in any fashion. Over the course of the last year, we've had the pleasure of getting to know the surrounding community with the intent of incorporating their feedback and creating an inclusive, welcoming project. Our outreach has been as diverse as the community. In addition to engaging these listed and other groups directly, we sponsored a professional poll to better understand priorities and interests of the broader public. In doing so, we confirmed that the, the community very much values the Bay Trail and increased recreational opportunities. We've also engaged community at more intimate levels, a site walk with members of the Sierra Club to discuss habitat, for example. These open conversations have meaningfully influenced the project design and priorities. By way of just a few examples, members of the Audubon Society and Sierra Club emphasize the value of uninterrupted riparian habitat. Elected officials helped underscore the importance of public transit, which informed our commitment to the shuttle system. 
local hotel owners helped underscore the importance of pedestrian connectivity. Bike advocates helped prioritize bike share node and its repair and water stations. Our holistic design has further evolved from this iterative community dialogue, including important meetings with BCDC staff, for which we're very grateful. I'll now turn it over to Kevin Conger of CMG to present the design in greater detail. Great, thank you, Virginia. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a privilege for us to work uh, on this project. I think um, it's exemplary of what development projects on the bay should do, which is to create nature on the bay, bay shore edge and to create public access uh, to nature and invitations for people to come to the, the, the bay's edge. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview tour of the project, and then I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit and flip, flip through some of the, um, the various areas. But st starting down here on the southern end, um, the new Bay Trail alignment connects into the existing Bay Trail. It runs, oops, I'm sorry. Give away all the special secrets that are coming up. I'm not going to use the little pointer anymore. So on the southern edge um, is the Bay Trail, and it goes all the way through the site, so it completes the, the Bay Trail link uh, on the waterfront. There's a plaza, uh, number two there, right at the intersection of Airport Boulevard and uh, Old Bay Shore, which is a, a plaza that's over some existing infrastructure uh, and overlooks that muted tidal wetland. That wetland is not um, so highly functioning right now because it doesn't get a whole lot of water, but it will with sea level rise when the inundation uh, increases. So that area is being um, preserved and enhanced. On the corner, of the southern corner of the building is you see the public cafe as number five there. Um, and with that public use is some um, outdoor dining, cafe um, seating associated with that. Um, uh, moving um, further along, numbers um, eight, is a discovery play area, and across from that is a, is a fitness area as well. So this is the sort of all ages uh, activity area. Um, and then moving further along, out closer to the shoreline, number 10 and number 9 is a um, area that's going to stay um, lower. I'll show you in the grading plan to provide um, future intertidal inter wetland zones when sea level rise occurs so that we're um, fostering more new wetlands along the bay shore, which we're going to desperately need with sea level rise. Um, and number 11 is a new bridge that crosses over Easton Creek to create the connectivity for the um, bay trail. And number 16 and 17 is uh, access down closer to the water's edge uh, and an overlook with number 16. So there's the possibility there for um, kayak launch or um, water access. Um, the, there's a few number sixes that you see along there, which are uh, outdoor picnic areas and gathering spaces. And um, the last one further up on the north is, the, um, is a bike share uh, facility, public bike share facility. Now along Easton Creek, um, public access on both sides of the creek, uh, number 13 on the southern side of Eastern Creek is a terraced area that steps down a little bit closer to Eastern Creek to get you a little bit closer to the nature along the creek. And, um, and then there's also a couple of different uh, outdoor picnic areas or kind of, you know, seating areas or hangout areas along, uh, along that side. So the, the intention is that the entire site will be publicly accessible, but more importantly that it will feel publicly inviting um, through the things that there are to do there. And you saw in Virginia's slides the other recreational amenities are in this area, and so programmatically there's not really a need for active recreations or sports fields or anything like that. Um, so this is really mostly about um, enjoying nature and creating a reason to be outside along the water's edge. Importantly, there is 40 public parking spaces in the south parking structure that will serve the um, public access to the waterfront and um, also to the public cafe. So here's a view at Easton Creek looking south. You see that boardwalk that's going over those, um, that lower area that will be future wetlands. 
I will say in some conversations with the Sierra Club, we've done some site tours with them, they have some reservations about the amount of public access we have in and around some of the areas that are intended for habitat. And so we're trying to find that right balance between creating habitat and creating public access and having both of them um, work together. Um, the grading strategy, the overview, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, we need to get up to six feet above um, base flood elevation, which is elevation 17 for this part of the bay. That's primarily happening up with the bay trail alignment, um, but you can see that that higher elevation and bay trail alignment is not always out at the water's edge. We've pulled it back uh, into the site in a few areas to create some, some areas that will remain low, as I mentioned, to um, provide future intertidal habitat areas. Um, the, the, build, the FFE on the buildings are set at um, 16, and the parking structures are at 11.5. So um, that sets up the basic grading strategy. I will say that, you know, as you guys are probably thinking, the 17 is, is, is certainly higher than we would have um, proposed for the project before the city made the requirements to go up to that high. We might have come with a more adaptive um, strategy, but um, it's code now, and so we need to be compliant with the um, city guidance. Uh, a few sections. The red dashed line is the existing grade. You can see in the upper left and in the one right below that how there are some areas that are either staying at existing grade or in some cases being excavated down at the water's edge to provide more um, future intertidal habitat. And then there are some areas um, like the, the upper right hand side where we don't have a lot of horizontal distance before we need to get to the water to come up to that um, elevated flood protection. So we're doing that with vertical seawall or terraces uh, or other um, armored shorelines. And you can see down below these existing conditions of the shoreline um, and what we believe will be a huge improvement by um, doing the proposed project. So the, the upper right shows the existing conditions with three and a half feet of sea level rise and a hundred year storm. So you can see most of the site will be flooded. That's the lighter blue. Um, and they, there's some other flood scenarios there, there in the darker views that are a little bit lower. But there is significant risk to this part of the, um, to the shoreline. The one on the lower left show, with the dark green band shows where the elevated um, flood protection alignment will be, the line of defense. And again, to reiterate, you can see there are a few areas that are on the bay side of that line of defense, intentionally so and the uh, lower right then shows what the, the future um, flood situation would be if these improvements were made. So that this site, as well as the, all of the section of the city that's behind it, will be protected from sea level rise flooding. Um, <clears throat> as I said, with the main objective to create nature and provide access to it, um, we've been working with H.C. Harvey and the biologist um, with that group to think about the right type of um, habitats to provide here on the bay shore and what the right soil grading, planting, hydrological conditions are to support those habitats and we're still in progress with that. Um, there is um, some thinking going on behind the regional connections to the bike and pedestrian access and so how do you get there uh, if you're on a bike or if you're walking. So the orange lines show the off-site existing um, pedestrian routes. The green line shows the off-site existing bike routes to give you a little bit better understanding of how folks might get to this site if they're not driving and parking in one of the public parking spaces that's provided. And this is pedestrian circulation, so we're intending to create a quite porous site, as I mentioned, um, with the primary higher quality connections being through Easton Creek and on the um, southern edge um, along Bayshore and Airport uh, Boulevard, but other areas of the site will also be accessible for the public should they want to walk through there. Um, and uh, similarly with the bicycle access, um, and just to also point out again that there's a bike share facility in the parking structure on the north, several public bike parking uh, areas along the Bay Trail and Eastern Creek, and then in addition there is going to be um, private park bike parking areas inside the garages for the uh, employees. So we're really trying to make it biker friendly so that people will be encouraged to ride their bike uh, or to take a bike share and 
use that to go back and forth or to the public to you know, be there, hop on the bike, or come there on the bike. Visual access through the site is really by enhancing the um, landscape areas along Eastern Creek and on that southern um, area to make it inviting. So when you're on Bayshore Boulevard, that you really feel that there is a reason to go out there and that you're welcomed uh, out there. Um, but the, there's also porosity maintained between the building through the way that the buildings are oriented uh, on the site. So the architects have laid everything out to try and um, make as much access as possible visual access. So here we are at the southern end, just to give you a sense of the scale. It's about um, 200 feet wide, and I, I can't read that, but longer than it is wide. Um, and you see the rendering on the upper left, preliminary rendering that shows um, the plaza, which we think will be a real visual gateway and a, a welcoming um, gateway into the site as people are driving by where they'll sort of think, oh, let's, let's go check that out. Let's go down there and go out to the waterfront. And you also see on the plan is the little bit of enlargement on the, on the cafe and the outdoor dining and seating and the way that the um, Bay Trail interacts with all of that. And some sections through um, that area, so you can see where we have the room that we're widening out the areas around the tidal wetland so that will be bigger and more um, healthy in the future. And where we have less room on the top section where we're using vertical tools like a seawall to uh, create the flood protection. And then this is the intersection of Easton Creek and the shoreline, so um, again showing the the uh, discovery play area, the outdoor fitness area, the outdoor seating area, the boardwalk and overlooks, and the bridge, and a rendering of what that is um, starting to look like as the materials are coming together. And a few sections through that. And uh, a couple more moving a little bit further north now um, up the shoreline, but they're sort of similar in their um, strategies. And some um, views of Easton Creek. It's it's a pretty big um, area, actually. The little plan on the left shows an overlay of South, South Park uh, here in the city. And that outer oval is South Park building edges. So that's building a building, including sidewalk, curb, and all that. And you can see the length is pretty similar to South Park as well. So it's a pretty large space. And we think that's going to be a really um, popular destination for uh, the public and also the people that are um, working here to come down and sit along the creek and sit on the terrace seating and uh, experiencing that uh, nature. And this is a, a view of what that is starting to look like. Also highlights the attention to the ground floor uh, architecture so that that lower level of these buildings is feeling um, much more public and much more uh, welcome. In a few sections um, through that. The materials are coming together with as much natural materials we can, um, warm materials where we can, so stone, wood, DG, um, concrete inevitably. Um, so this is kind of where we are in terms of the, the development of the material palette at this point. And the, similarly with the planting, it's still preliminary, but we're looking at um, all native or predominantly native plants that will support the habitat that um, um, H.T. Harvey's identifying, <clears throat> but also uh, keeping in mind durability and maintenance. While we do have a um, good maintenance client on this project, we do need to make sure that the plants are going to last and um, be durable. And that, that's the same with the trees, primarily natives, uh, although not all of them because there's some non-native trees that just do very well in these um, bay conditions. There is a um, preliminary signage plan that includes wayfinding, directional signage, but also interpretive signage to tell the stories of the site culturally and um, ecologically. And um, along with this, of course, is a lighting, preliminary lighting scheme that is mostly trying to keep low, uh, light levels low and down low, enough for safety, but not enough to disrupt the habitat in uh, nighttime sky. And um, we have been working with H.T. Harvey on the, uh, with the ornithologist there for the best practices in bird safety. So um, we're following all of their recommendations and all the best practices in terms of um, the glass treatment, the guardrails, plantings, or no plantings up on the upper levels of the buildings and things that will attract um, birds into these uh, buildings. 
Um, with that, um, Seth, would you like to wrap us up? I'm uh, happy to. Terrific, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our formal presentation. And as mentioned at the outset, uh, we do very much look forward to your board's uh, thoughtful questions and commentary, and we'll do our level best as a team to respond. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Seth and all the team, for the presentation. Uh, it was very helpful, uh, very comprehensive. Thank you. And very thoughtful, too, and I appreciate, Virginia, your comments about you know, how critical this is in terms of uh, Bay Trail connectivity. It's certainly something that has struck us as well. Okay, so uh, let's move to clarifying uh, questions from the project presentation from the board. Uh, does anyone want to kick off? Good. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit. I'm just curious about the shoreline parcels and if you've been connecting with them at all, kind of give us a little bit more context around what's the opportunity or lack of opportunity there. So, I did, so specifically the question about just where our property line stops and someone else's begins, right? I was assuming, and um, thank you very much for sort of scrolling back. <clears throat> Be helpful diagrammatically. Uh, we have had some communication uh, with the private property owner um, to the north of the site. Uh, at this moment, I would probably best characterize it as simply it's a private property owner to the north. And uh, there's no reason to think that uh, we'll uh, be able to, and we're certainly not planning to cross the property line, is the short answer. Okay. Um, and then um, I also I appreciated the context about the outreach and that you did. That was really helpful. And um, I was just wondering what was the process that led to the kind of programming strategy, specifically because this is, you know, it's an office, potentially R&D, and then there's a playground. So I was wondering what was, you know, if there was some discussion there that led to that or uh, what was that choice? Virginia, would you like to speak to that? Sure, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think in terms of the programming of the site, a couple things that influenced it, the recreational program is specifically is related to the Parks and Rec Master Plan. And the Parks and Rec Master Plan done by the city engaged some like 2,500 community stakeholders to set priorities and sort of a master list of what already exists, what's already planned. And so we tried to fill in gaps in that master plan as much as possible and sort of respect the research that had already been done by the city and sort of broader community. And then I think that was additionally sort of supported by our public poll. So we, we did this public poll that ranks different priorities of, you know, community benefits that local citizens cared about. And so that resulted in some of our of our programming. And we think it's complementary to what's happening just south of the park. So there are baseball fields and like actually the baseball field group said they were excited about the idea of having a place to come where a food truck might be after a game, right? But not need another sort of formal recreational facility. With regards to just the ability to support children specifically, we don't think of this as like purely a corporate campus. This is a 24-7 place for the community. So we're, we're age agnostic in that respect. Can I add in too? I also think it's, we're not thinking of it as like a destination playground, not even really a playground. It's like if, you, if somebody goes here with their kids, is there enough for the kids to do where they're not going crazy? You know, it's like a discovery play area. So I don't think you would come here to go to play that. The last question I had was just a more specific technical question, which is there's sort of a textured green area between the south parking structure and building one. And I was wondering what is that like an access or is that EVA or what is the what is that? That is the EVA route, right, Justin? Yeah, which may be green or not green. Okay, all right. That's all I had. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, Andrew. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I had a few uh, questions. Well, one is I'm kind of struck by the amount of space on the site occupied by the parking structures, and the amount of parking for the site. I think it's almost 4,000 spaces, given your pretty close to the Caltrain, <clears throat> Burlingame Caltrain. You have the shuttle, you have 500 bicycle parking. So 
Is this just a city code driven amount of parking? I mean, I'd hate for you to build this parking and have it not be used and it is occupying a lot of the site. Right. Um, no, it's a, that's an excellent question. Um, and again, from our perspective, uh, it's a significant investment in a major new campus. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we think we we're sort of trying to balance both the city's parking requirements and what we would just consider the market parking requirements uh, for a project of this nature. And so um, we do think we're on that, um, uh, that sort of healthy tension line uh, for what the market will expect for a project of this type uh, in terms of the buildings themselves. Um, well, still in all, um, trying to make sure that uh, the structures haven't expanded laterally very much. They're actually uh, going down and up. As structure, so we think we've also tried to minimize their just the footprints of these relative to the overall project, which itself is also not trying to maximize the potentially available square footage. Okay. Available. So it sounds like it's slightly above city code in terms of the number of spaces. Uh, I, it, it, it is. I'm not sure uh, to what degree. Yeah, there's not a city. It's above the minimum, but there's not a city map. Okay. Better stated. All right. Um, the second question was, for those parking structures along the edge, along the waterfront edge, what's happening in those structures? Are those blank walls or you're seeing into parking with cars? I mean, it's because it's a pretty long extent, too, that you're walking along and you've got this not very interesting, you know, large structure there. Sure, I can try to speak to that. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's quite a bit going on, actually. Uh, we're in the process of coordinating the grading um, and with the streets and the civil design and the landscape, but we're right now planning to do a somewhat unconventional uh, circulation strategy where the major elevator bank in each of those parking structures will be on the bay front side, on the, the bay shore, well, on the side facing the bay, um, not bay shore highway, which will take those 4,000 drivers coming to the site and deposit them directly onto the bay trail um, so that each of them will be taking the scenic route from the garage to the buildings. Um, that's one way. The other idea is that directly across from both of those parking structure facades is a meaningful piece of programming. Um, the Nature Discovery Playground is directly across from the south parking structure, while there's a planned bike share hub directly across from the north parking structure. So the combination of public access moving in and out um, and other public facing amenities located directly adjacent to them, um, we think that'll be a meaningful way of activating those facades. Great, thank you. And then one final question was just about the shoreline band, especially as it relates to the shoreline along the bay. There are, it seems like there are lots of little corners and nubs of the buildings kind of intruding into the shoreline band. And I'm wondering whether, is, are those truly necessary components? I mean, looking at building one, it's got like these little corners there where the shoreline band is kind of getting narrowed because it has these poking, these things poking into in a conceptual phase that could be developed? I'm sorry, and Ben, I'd invite you uh, to sort of answer that as well because there may be a distinction between uh, the ground plane at that <coughs> level and sort of whatever the, the nubs are that um, Andrew is referring to um, and uh, sort of what happens above potentially in terms of building articulation. Yeah, definitely. There's a, a datum we've tried to strike between the upper parts of the building which are quieter and glassier and meant to recede from the lower two levels of the buildings, which are more articulated and more um, kind of textural in their materials. And there are a lot of ins and outs um, that we're using to bring down the scale to make it more human scaled, but to also indicate points of entry, points of access, points of activity. Um, and the, the nubs and bumps that you're seeing in the plan are, are accurate and they are part of that kind of architectural strategy to, to activate the ground plane. Um, in terms of the amount of building coverage, we have pushed the buildings as close to each other as they can be, leaving only the bare minimum for the EVA lane between building one and south parking, and again between south parking and building three, the same between building two and north parking. Um, but that said, the, the building footprint that we're showing is the amount of area that we're proposing. So that does extend the full height of the building. Thank you. And if I might just add one quick thing on that, which is what Seth alluded to earlier, is that the allowable FAR on this site is 3.0, and we're actually below that um, in part to get out of the band as much as possible and to really invest in a public realm that we think is meaningful. Thank you. Relative to um, 
Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Very clear and beautifully done. Appreciate that. Um, relative to the connectivity from Old Bayshore Highway, is that a drop-off at Easton Creek? Is that an auto drop-off? And can you just say briefly any sidewalk or right-of-way improvements that you're planning for Bayshore? Uh, uh, that is a drop-off, um, and uh, we do have uh, uh, two laybys and or turnouts currently. A potential for a third uh, is part of the programming in the public right-of-way or just behind the public right-of-way now. Um, and because, as mentioned earlier during uh, Kevin's presentation, what we've tried and has been sort of further emphasized, the notion from an urban scale was try to move the buildings as close together as possible while providing these very clear um, uh, sort of uh, acceptance opportunities at the South Plaza where uh, the grade at the back of the sidewalk is a little higher and sort of invites you into the site to approach the bay there. And again, at Easton Creek, because it feels like that's another, again, very clear moment of receptivity uh, to bring you out to the bay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Tom. Thanks. Yeah, nice, nice presentation. Well managed, you know. You can go on forever. It's great. Really well done. Um, my main question concerns the footprints of Building 2 and Building 3. So there are significant portions that are inside shoreline band. And so what I'm wondering is what is being done in the ground floor of those two buildings to make that shoreline orientation happen? Or be, what's, what's the thought there? And, and again, from that perspective, Ben, I'd invite you to talk a little bit about your buildings. Sure. The, um, I think the, the, the first move that we considered when placing these buildings is that they were rotated um, so that the, it's the narrow dimension facing the bay, and we're trying to open up as much space um, between the buildings as we can. Um, the next thing we did was to start to shape these spaces in between the buildings and to use the architecture in that shaping process. Um, the lower levels, which we discussed previously, have the, the more articulated shaping, while the upper levels, which are much more planar and glassy, are still kind of cupping around Easton Creek. Um, to kind of reinforce that it is a, a public space and that these buildings are kind of in service of that public space. Um, in terms of the ground floor activity, we're providing glass as much as we can. Uh, there'll be entrances into the buildings from Easton Creek. There'll also be entrances into the cycle center um, where many of the bikers coming to this facility are able to uh, store their bikes. Um, and then the, the rest of the kind of seating and amphitheater and public gathering areas um, are placed directly outside the buildings. So that's some of the, the treatment that we're considering for the ground floor. Um, and then, of course, on Building 1, there is a fully public retail facility. You mentioned a bike center. I see some bikes in your rendering here. One portion of it. Yeah, and I, I can speak a little bit to that, um, as well as, as part of the off-site improvement um, program for the project, we're going to be extending the bike lane along Bayshore Highway for the full length of the project site. Um, there's going to be a balance of uh, private bike storage that's within the buildings, serving the tenants coming to the buildings, and public bike storage distributed throughout the site. Um, the cycle centers that we're referring to are the tenant bike storage, it's kind of the, the private long-term bike storage for people who are working in the buildings, leaving their bikes throughout the day. But these have the potential to become kind of ground floor activators. Uh, not just a, a deep, dark storage room, but a bright, glassy um, kind of showcase for this amount of activity. And there'll be one of those centers located adjacent to the lobby of each of the buildings, um, all three on the Bayshore Highway side. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, I have one more question uh, just concerning uh, anticipated phasing for the campus. And, and how you would anticipate the Bay Trail being constructed? I, I, uh, at the moment, our anticipated phasing uh, would be what's on the screen, uh, uh, Building 1 and the south parking structure, uh, and uh, the south plaza that goes along with that, sort of moving to the north page, you know, left, uh, up toward Easton Creek, uh, would be uh, essentially completion of those improvements in the public realm in those two buildings with a temporary bay trail on the other side of Easton Creek, 
um, in preparation for what is, again, currently anticipated to be the second phase of the project, which would be the north parking structure and building two, and then concluding uh, ultimately with building three in the middle. So when, which phase would the bridge across Eastern Creek be built? I think in, in our minds to, again, get to the, uh, the notion of having great value for the temporary pay trail portion on the, again, sort of page left here, the northerly portion, uh, would be built within phase one. Okay. Again, so that there is true connectivity. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so that uh, concludes the clarifying questions uh, from the project presentation. So thank you all for the presentation again. Uh, we'll move to public comment now, and uh, let's open the meeting to public comment. Any member of the public attending the meeting in person, please notify Board Secretary Andrea if you would like to make a comment. If you're attending online and would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand to speak. Remember, if you are joining our meeting via phone, you must press star 9 on your keypad to raise your hand to make a comment. To unmute or mute, press star 6. You will be called in the order that your hand was raised and you will have three minutes to speak. Ashley will note when you have one minute remaining and please state your name and affiliation for the record at the beginning of your comment. As mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, if you would like to add your contact information to the interest of parties list to be notified for future meetings concerning this project, please call or email Andrea Gaffney. Okay, the first comment we have is received by email from uh, the Bay Trail with Lee Wo. Um, this was the comment. Uh, one of the comments uh, was about the outdoor cafe. Um, I'll start at the top. Uh, the first comment was uh, about Bay Trail width and capacity. Um, the ranges are between 16, 18, and 20 feet. Um, there are many projects proposed in Burlingame, as we've all seen in the past three or four design review board meetings. Um, so really responding to the proposed capacity um, with the width of the Bay Trail. Um, we'll send you these comments so that you have them uh, if you haven't received them already. Uh, next one is the Easton Creek Bridge. Um, confirm that it will both accommodate both pedestrians and cyclists um, and request that the width uh, best match the rest of the Bay Trail in the area. Outdoor Cafe uh, is the next issue. Um, how it's you know, located directly adjacent to the Bay Trail um, to ensure that the seating and circulation for the cafe is designed to avoid impacts from any users of the Bay Trail and people moving along the Bay Trail. Fourth comment is about trail amenities um, and incorporating amenities for trail users. Um, he's saying that this is a positive uh, aspect of this project, um, new bicycle parking, bike repair stations, bike share, and interpretive signage. Um, they also ask that the sponsors consider adding a water fountain or a bot bottle filling station. Um, and then the fifth comment is, is regarding trail design. Um, and then this is, again, about hard angles and turns, um, softening those up. Um, to allow for safety of navigation um, throughout the site along the Bay Trail. So uh, that's the email comment that we have, and then I'll hand it over to Ashley to notify if we have any people online. We have no public comment. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Uh, Given no public comment, I just, first of all, just want to say thank you for the online comment um, and the, the points made by Lee Ho, um, very thoughtful and all very relevant. So um, thank you, Lee, if you uh, have joined the meeting. Okay, let's go to uh, our next, uh, our next uh, section here, which is uh, board discussion and advice. And so um, I think this is probably the right uh, exhibit to have up on the screen for this. Uh, so what I'd like to do, um, as you know, we always want to consider our seven main objectives and we saw some exhibits that talk to public access, usable access, the visual corridor access, 
um, visual quality of the bay, con comic connections, continuity along the shoreline, the bay setting, uh, compatible with wildlife, and um, we can talk more about those as we speak. And then the three questions that we were asked to consider, um, you know, how can other public spaces really feeling public at this stage of the design process? Um, and does the proposal allow for the shoreline to be enjoyed by the greatest number of people? Are there additional improvements that could improve the public access experience along the shoreline and the creek? And are the public access areas appropriately designed to be resilient and adapted to sea level rise in balance with ensuring high quality public access opportunities? So let's keep those in mind as we speak. And um, I think some of the clarifying questions will probably promote some of the dialogue uh, amongst the group. Uh, who would like to kick off? Kristen, I'm going to go to you again. Okay. <laughs> I'm sort of going left to right. That's today. great. Next um, month we'll go right to the <laughs> I'll be prepared for that. <laughs> um, I wanted to think about this question of the how does the project proposal result in public spaces that feel public? And just sort of building on the comments about um, buildings two and three kind of significantly stepping into the shoreline band, the size of the parking structures, it sort of feels like there's these big parking structures that are pushing the buildings into the shoreline band. And I totally understand site planning and the challenges of trying to park at high ratios and I think the, the shuttle commitment is fantastic, that, and I think I understand that that's a really big commitment. I think the reason that I um, am sort of responding to this space, particularly between buildings two and three, is that it does feel like a very pinched area, um, particularly for creek experience and habitat, and I appreciate the comparison to South Park, um, which is a fantastic urban space. But I think the main difference here with South Park is that South Park is occupied fully across the whole stretch of it, whereas this has this creek in the middle of it, which you're circulating around. Um, and in terms of how does it feel public and inviting, I think the challenge in this context, which is a little bit more suburban, is that the paths come very close to the buildings and the... Um, which are somewhat activated visually with glazing, it sounds like, but are not publicly activated, right? Um, and then also most of the public spaces are kind of um, almost like four courts to the buildings. They're sort of like happening at the building entries, which makes them feel a little bit like, you know, uh, uh, ante rooms to entries instead of really truly public places. So just as one thought, um, if there was a little bit more space given to the programming itself uh, and maybe even a little fewer instances of the programming, but the programming that did happen was a little bit more generous, maybe that would be a way to kind of uh, help make it feel a little bit more public. But I really am struggling to find a way to, to think about the space between building two and three feeling kind of public and generous and accessible given its current dimension. And I would just love the other board members' take on that because I know that's a tricky thing to deal with in a site plan. So those are my main thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's just, we might want to build on that because that's a critical space and I think the other really critical space is uh, adjacent to building one so we might want to talk about both of those um, and the interface with the bay because the lots to the north are not um, being considered as part of this as well so um, Andrew do you want to weigh in? Yeah I mean I, I would say I agree with Kristen but I would also want to comment about the buildings intruding into the shoreline band along the bayfront, especially that long length of that south parking structure, seems to me that that really diminishes kind of your experience of being along the waterfront. You're coming along, and you're because of the orientation of the site, you're sort of facing that building for quite a long, as you're coming from the exits from the west, 
you're look you're on this angle, so you're sort of facing that very long elevation, and then it clips into the shoreline band, sort of giving you more more of that elevation than is necessary. And that's sort of a really critical part of the site there, because those pads are sort of turning at that point there. And you've got that little play area, but thinking about how to make that feel really public and not kind of owned by this. Even even you're describing architectural treatment to that building, but it's still a parking structure. It has no program that is of interest, and it's facing the bay. It's taking such a width of building, the most incredible view possible, and it's housing cars. It's just, I wish that it wasn't housing so many cars. And so going on to that same message, I would encourage you, thinking about the future of transportation and so many companies providing shuttles uh, for their employees and so many, and the amenities you're providing with your own shuttle and the proximity to transportation and so many people being interested in bikes, just to think about whether in the long future, whether this many parking spaces is, are really necessary because in terms of the whole experience of the site, introducing this many cars to the site is having a big impact. I mean, it's just a lot of cars and everybody's going to be coming in at, you know, eight o'clock and they're all going to be going up eight levels or down two levels. I mean, it's just that whole experience of being in your car and the traffic created by it is impacting Old Bayshore Highway and its waterfront experience. So. Andrew, could I just I want to build on that because, you know, we also heard that the potential phasing starts from the south and goes north, goes north. And so if you visualize phase one, building one, and then the south parking structure, it's like a massive parking structure with a smaller office building. And yeah. it seems to me if you could perhaps rethink that, um, scale down that structure, maybe you can wrap the... Uh, the side that faces the open site, maybe there's a, some office that could actually wrap that, um, but maybe put more of the parking on the northern end because by the time you get there, it may be clear how much parking is really needed for the project. And, you know, if it was really needed, um, maybe you can put another floor of parking on that, uh, the final mm -hmm. structure to be built. Uh, and because I love the idea of having the elevators, uh, you know, up at the end of the building, uh, facing the open space. Uh, so, you know, if it turned out that the north parking structure had another floor of parking on it and you could shrink the footprint for the south parking structure, which which is in such a sort of central part of the site, it seems almost a little curious to put the parking structure in that location. But, um, but if you could shrink that footprint a bit, you know, then you could play with the site plan a bit and uh, I think really improve it. So yeah, it would make a big difference if it was the same width as the north parking structure and being instead of being so fast, I think it would then maybe building three could move a little bit to the left and yeah. we'd get more but you know, the space that Kristen was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gary, do you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, yeah, there's so much to talk about here and I think that's because it was a really great uh, presentation, a super thoughtful project. Um, at, I think it is transformative. I don't think that's hyperbole, uh, especially as one who's naively once tried to ride my bicycle to Burlingame from San Francisco and you get, to the, <laughs> get to the airport and you just kind of get thrown to the dog. So I think just that in itself is, is um, really important. Um, the community engagement I thought was impressive. Um, the relationship to Caltrain is great. Uh, I'm going through these just in the order they came up for me. I want to just a moment about the um, cafe. I think in the past, this is really a discussion for the group, question for the group. I think we've taken a position that the Bay Trail needs to have an independent expression so it's really clear that it's public. And here where we show the, the paving of the cafe going across the Bay Trail, which I really like, I think in general we haven't encouraged that in the past. In this case, if the Bay Trail was all one material, let's say it's asphalt or concrete, something uh, fairly common, you know, it does, it does detract from the cafe, which could be a really great experience. At the same time, I know we've talked about how safety is an issue. If you encourage people to spill out, you know, into the um, Bay Trail, you know, that can have conflicts. So I just put that out there uh, for discussion. Uh, let's see. The build, the transparency of the building, you know, shown from the bay, I think it's 
really great the way it kind of reflects the clouds and it's not like mirrored, but it seems like it's more subtle than that and I've seen that effect on other buildings to really positive effects. So I think I hope as the buildings go forward that you know they can maintain that level of transparency and detail and choosing the glass and, and all that. Uh, and I know you have to balance that with all your bird safe uh, issues and so on. Uh, but I but I think the drawings that are shown are really spectacular that what's up above the base level kind of is meant to disappear in the sky, and I, I think that is possible to achieve. Um, I'm still curious about the quality of the sidewalks, a little bit on Bayshore. If you did mention that, uh, Seth, in more detail, I kind of missed it, if they're going to get wider. And the buildings are pretty tight to the sidewalk, so, you know, having a little more room for planting, you know, I know we're fighting for space here, but I think it could have a really big positive impact for pedestrians if people do approach on foot, you know, building one, the south parking structure, or we see the north parking structure. Um, I'm not sure that's, you know, we're, it's outside our area of purview, but it has to do with access, and, you know, I'm not sure it's a great walking street anyway, but I'll just put that out there. Um, the view corridors from Bayshore, you know, three of them are through parking lots or, you know, automobile access areas and uh, Easton Creek is incredible, that's going to be great, but you know, uh, for those fingers, for someone walking or biking by, it would be great to have these little secret view of the, of the bay. So if there's something that can be done with the paving to really enhance that experience so it doesn't look like a utility zone at the foreground to the um, bay view. Um, uh, I think the soft edge of the shoreline, uh, what what you're proposing, if it can be achieved, is, is really fantastic. I mean, we always encourage people to manhandle the shoreline a little bit with, you know, because a lot of the shoreline is not worth preserving in its current condition, so I think being bold in, um, you know, approaching that is, you know, really great. I hope, I hope we get that. Um, working with biologists, uh, and planting palette looks thoughtful, realistic, it's not just bunch of plant pictures. I think they're, it's a really good plant palette where it's headed. So that concludes my comments. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gary. Uh, Tom. Yeah, these are all great comments, and, and I really support uh, what was said. Um, I do think that the bike trail is too tight to the cafe on the south side. There can be some conflicts there. It'd be nice to be able to overlook the <clears throat> The wildland down below somehow, but I'm sure that can be managed. Um, I support all the concern about the parking structures. I think that they are forcing things on the site that are undesirable, <clears throat> chiefly pushing building two and three deeply into the shoreline band. Now, I, I think it's, it's, I mean, I appreciate the uh, discussion about the formal language of the building within lower stories and stuff like that, but I think it's just incumbent on the applicant to demonstrate how all those areas are shoreline oriented. You can accept maybe that the facade, you know, is coming in, but at the, where the public is operating, I think there's got to be very clear demonstration of how, what the public's getting out of that. That's all. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, I just want to pick up on the the southern end, the southern inlet, uh, we haven't really talked about that much. I think it's fantastic that there's a, a cafe there, and I think, but I think that node, it, when you zoom out, some of the early exhibits sort of show the shape of the broader shoreline, and this inlet, when you visit it, is uh, quite a special place. You know, it's very enclosed, and it really is the sort of the elbow of the. Of, uh, you feel like you're in quite an enclosed inlet at that point. So it will be very attractive. It's a perfect place to, to put the cafe, so great job on site planning at that point. Um, but I do feel like, again, uh, the public cafe sort of reduces the sense of, uh, you know, it, it, it's, I think, a good incursion into, into the setback to, and a good public use. But I think, uh, you know, again, the more you could do to um, broaden the zone that's around the public cafe but still keep clear 
delineation of the, the Bay Trail will be important. So it just feels like it's very tight at that point. And I would encourage you to, as the design develops, to just think about how, um, you know, how much space, because the public, the the Bay Trail comes around the, you know, comes away from the water's edge at that point, and I think that's fine. Uh, but I really feel like uh, the Bay Trail needs to be very clearly delineated with with plenty of space um, around it, because this is going to be a, I think, a, a place where people will want to. It will be a somewhat of a destination, um, and I think a place that feels public. I think it's very challenging elsewhere to, you know, in a campus like this for people to feel if they're coming in between these buildings, you know, it, it's not going to feel incredibly uh, public. Um, I just wanted to come back to also to make a comment about the, um, the public parking spaces, 44 spaces, I think, that will be inside one of these buildings. And again, I just think for navigation of people coming to the site, because those are in a way invisible, they're inside a structure, um, I think it's really critical that people know that they're public. So, and, you know, it would be lovely in a way to see them uncovered and distributed, but again, the site plan is very tight at this, at this point. But, uh, you know, I'm not a huge fan of seeing all public spaces, parking spaces put inside structures. They just don't feel public to people. So if you could give some thought to that, it would be great to even have a few spaces that are um, outside the structure. Uh, and then um, I just want to uh, comment on the bridge and the, the comments that Mr. Ho made about um, the width of the trail. And I, I don't think in this location that a trail at 16 feet wide is appropriate. I really think it needs to be 18 or 20. And, and the bridge should be generous. Um, I enjoyed, I was very excited to be looking at the documents as I stepping stoned across the current creek, which was a nice adventure. Um, and uh, so it's great that the bridge will be there, but again, it should, it should be an adequate width. So I really support those um, early comments. And I would also say that, uh, just coming back to how critical this connection is, when you uh, make it into, uh, keep going north, uh, towards the airport, where the Bay Trail does exist in the adjoining developments, it's really well used and people are walking out there for lunch. You know, you can just see it's a, and, and this will be similar. There will be a lot of people uh, using the trail. So I, I wouldn't underestimate the, uh, you know, the, the need for good balance between to accommodate cyclists and um, pedestrians. It's, it's going to be a really valuable uh, resource. And, you know, obviously comments for signage and orientation and so on will be important. Um, I mean, Eastern Creek is a really uh, incredible resource to have on the site, um, but I just want to ditto the earlier comments on that. I think it's really important. Um, so I think that's everything. Um, yeah, I was just looking at my notes. I think that's, that's uh, all I wanted to add in. Other comments? Kristen? I just, oh, well, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say one more thing, which is that um, the these paths through the site, um, which are sort of view corridors, I, I thought, Gary, your point about the quality of the view, making those not look so back of house was important. I also think um, they're reading right now very much as just auto kind of loading access. And if they are truly meant to be pedestrian access to the Bay Trail, um, pedestrian access to this waterfront, series of waterfront places, I think there needs to be much more obvious, you know, sidewalks, signage, um, planting that makes it much more obvious that this is an inviting path towards the waterfront. Right now, they they feel very back of house. If you were walking along Bayshore, I don't know if you'd feel comfortable walking down there or even know that there was necessarily something to walk to. So thinking about what's at the end of the view, what is the pedestrian facility or bike facility that will get you through those kind of paths, especially as they run along parking structures, which are, you know, you know, low visibility, faster drivers, et cetera. 
and potentially losing one or two of those to widen Easton Creek would probably be a win. <laughs> okay, any further discussion or comments? Captured everything? Okay. Um, well, I, mean, I, I just yes. I just want to add, I think the landscape project is doing a great job here. And I just think he's having to work too hard in the, in the, in the creek. It's too much of a canyon because it's just too tight. So right. he needs a little more space to operate, right. one way or another, yeah. whether it's architectural or a combination of something. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I do want to applaud, I think others said it, but I, I do think that the uh, approach to the programming um, and the, the landscape design is excellent. Um, yeah, just a little pinched, but uh, pinch for space, but uh, excellent. Okay, well, I think that concludes our um, board discussion and advice. And uh, so we will now ask for the project proponent to provide a response. Okay, which uh, we're very happy to do, um, uh, as expected. Uh, some very thoughtful commentary, and that's why we're here. And uh, uh, we'll take all of this to heart uh, in terms of your perspectives, from uh, bay trail widths and consistency there, too, to some of the geometries, the interface with uh, the public realm at the South Plaza that we've heard several times with regard to, um, again, the interaction with what we think we're hearing is still in all a good amenity as a notion, the public cafe and the space associated with it. Uh, to the view quarters themselves. The primary view quarters um, and points of access, again, that we tried to emphasize, we have viewed clearly as uh, the South Plaza and uh, Easton Creek itself uh, on both sides. And again, to your points, uh, the other locations are inevitably secondary to some degree. But again, we'll, we'll hear all these comments and um, sort of go back and uh, think about them a little bit, including uh, materiality, as a for instance. Some of the other comments from uh, the Bay Trail Coalition about um, uh, Water fountains, bottle fill stations, those are easy things for us to do. We're happy to accommodate uh, those kinds of um, uh, amenities, again, in the public realm. Uh, one thing I would like to sort of draw out a little bit, I thought I almost heard um, uh, Member Hall sort of maybe too many programmatic elements in the landscape. Uh, you know, you, you made reference to the anteroom uh, sort of nature of some of these, uh, as opposed to, I thought I heard maybe. Um, uh, sort of appreciation for the many elements. So can we, maybe I misheard is all uh, in terms of that kind of a thing. Or is the landscape, is the programming trying to do too much in the public realm or just enough? And we haven't sort of, it was more your comment, I guess, if you don't mind. Sure. If that's possible to get feedback. Sure, yeah. sure. It was um, sort of thinking about this idea of how do you make it feel more public? and wondering if the location and size of some of those amenities, like for example, the little kind of seating area, number 15, in front of building three, you know, is that gonna feel public to people or is it gonna feel kind of like the front door of a, you know, if you're there on the weekend or something, is it gonna feel like you're sitting at the lobby of a building? Check, helpful. Things, so, things like that. So maybe giving a little bit more space to some of those things or pulling them away from the building, just clarifying what's a public programming element and what's kind of a building forecourt element. And then along the creek as well, you know, at, at 14 and 15, some of those seating areas along the building, just clarifying that this is in the, this is a public place that you're not kind of like, no, one's, no security guards are going to come move you along during business hours. Perfect. Helpful. Again, that, that actually is very, very helpful. Um, and so, um, uh, again, with that, I think we've heard the commentary and we will take it back. And um, again, we very much appreciate uh, the engagement. That's exactly why we're here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Just sent out, I need to hear from you guys about, excuse me. I need to hear from the board as to whether or not you'd like to see this project again. Uh, it sounds like you do from your comments, so I just want to clarify that. Look, I believe we do. I think it really, yes, we would like to see this again. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I think with that, we will move to adjournment of the meeting. Andrew, unless there's anything else? Okay. Uh, I will just make one reminder, and Andrea, could I ask you in the communication to the board, because we won't be meeting next month, it will be two months away, uh, can you remind the board to review the minutes 
of which there will be a number of uh, minutes to review because we won't remember that in two months' time. So, um, highlighter, highlight marker, please, Andrea. Yes. So, book that into your schedules, guys. Yes, I will send you several reminders. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll move to adjourn the meeting. I uh, want to thank uh, the BCDC team tonight. Excellent job, everybody. It went really smoothly and uh, uh, great presentations by the team as well. Thank you very much. So this concludes our project review for the meeting. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion and a second to adjourn our meeting. Uh, do I'll I have make a motion, motion to adjourn? I second. I think Andrew got him first for the second. I second. <laughs> Gary. I think there's an enthusiasm to adjourn given the Warriors' status tonight. So, um, 8272. Okay. Um, so, uh, are there any objections to adjourning the meeting? Okay. Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for coming in person to present as well. We appreciate it.